today we will mark up our seventh <laughs> bill on the floor on the uh, in the committee. And as you know, we finished up last night the fourth bill on the floor, uh, and the fifth bill on the floor will occur today in the form of uh, agriculture. We have two items on the agenda uh, today. Uh, the fis uh, fiscal uh, 15 Homeland Security Appropriations Bill and a uh, very minor revised 302B sub allocation that we'll get to it uh, when we finish the uh, Appropriations Bill. Now I'd like to recognize Chairman John Carter to present the uh, fiscal 15 Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. Judge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's my honor to present to this committee the fiscal year 2015 appropriations bill for the Department of Homeland Security. Similar to our subcommittee work over the past few years, this bipartisan bill is about our nation's security and fiscal priorities and getting them both right. Mr. Chairman, ordinarily my opening remarks explain how we were once again given an inadequate and poorly justified budget request for the administration and how our bill report to is, is to ref and, and how our bill and report rectifies the flaws in the president's budget proposal. That is certainly the case this year and Ranking Member Price and I have worked together to overcome such flaws and produce a solid product in front of all of you today. But what a difference a year, this year is, but what the difference is this year is that we received an even more shameful excuse for budgeting after our subcommittee unanimously reported out our bill. Not an official budget amendment, but rather a poorly drafted OMB letter sent to us on Friday night, two days after our subcommittee markup, that pleads with the committee to include, include appropriate flexibilities to fund the costs associated with the spiraling influx of unaccompanied alien children transmitting our southern, uh, southwestern border, and that's in the area of our state of Texas called the Valley. And this letter included no underlying facts, no analytical justification, and no way to fund or offset these growing costs. That's two days after we had, marked, uh, had finished our subcommittee uh, markup and passed it out. Now this budgetary gimmick from OMB would be sad if it wasn't so tragic. What we have here is an administration that has failed to adequately address the humanitarian disaster and law enforcement realities along the southwest border. Tens of thousands of children are being smuggled by profiting criminal organizations and descending upon the Texas Rio Grande Valley. Their families exploiting our immigration system and the entire situation, stressing our law enforcement agencies beyond the breaking points. So this bill before you today, coupled with our forthcoming bipartisan management amendment, seeks to fully address, as well as offset, all the known and projected costs associated with the necessary legal processing, transport, and immediate care of these children. Furthermore, the manager's amendment, which we wrote in full collaboration with our minority, also includes necessary oversight to ensure our committee obtains a full accounting of all such costs in the future. Ranking Member Price and I are committed to trying to appropriately address the UAC issue, and, are, and that's unaccompanied children, UAC, and appreciate working uh, collaborate, uh, working collaborative, collaboratively on what we think is a smart, tough, and reasonable solution that has been forged just within this last week. Now let's be clear about this. Our bipartisan solution is about the, managing, the management of the influx of children, stopping the flow and enforcement of the law as a means to do so is a separate issue that we perhaps disagree on. From where I sit, enforcement is necessary, but sadly lacking, 
lacking component of the solution. With the sizable increases to enforcement we provided in, in FY14 and that are recommended in FY15 bill, the administration has no excuse not to enforce the law and deter illegal migration and stop the money flowing to the cartels for this massive smuggling organization. As for the rest of this $39.2 billion bill, let me provide a few noteworthy details about the bipartisan product in front of you all. A nearly half billion dollar increase to ICE to sustain and improve all aspects of enforcement. Substantial increases to DHS counter narcotics, interdiction, and border security capabilities. Full funding of e for E-Verify. Full funding for the Department's cyber security programs. Restoration and sustainment of civil service investigations. Restoration and sustainment of FEMA first responder grants. Full funding for all projected disaster relief requirements and, and funding to support the completion of NBAF. But the bill also involves real fiscal discipline and efficiency, including substantial cuts to headquarters and sizable reductions to ineffectual offices and programs. Denial of all unauthorized personnel to increase fees on the traveling public and substantial oversight requirements, including withholding and statutory reporting requirements. And these requirements deal with critical issues, including ICE detainer, acquisitions, professional misconduct, and the purchase, inventory, and usage of ammunition and weapons. I must note that, once again, DHS has failed to comply with the statutory requirements enacted, enacted into law in, in FY14. Those failures are assertively addressed in the bill. We are serious about compelling the department to both enforce the law and comply with the law. We will not tolerate further failures in this regard. A point I think we make uh, very clear through zeroing out the Office of Legislative Affairs and the inclusion of new statutory over oversight. In closing, let me first sincerely thank Ranking Member Price. He's been a true partner on this bill. I sincerely thank him and his dedicated professional staff for their notable contributions. In addition, let me thank the thoughtful members of this committee. Your input was critical to, this, uh, to our oversight over the past few months as well as to the production of the bill. I know that my staff and I made every effort to accommodate virtually every member, member submission uh, we received, and that has only made the product quite a bit stronger. Finally, I must thank the distinguished chairman and ranking member of the full committee, Chairman Rogers, Ms. Lowy. Your import and support of this bill is genuinely appreciated. I sincerely believe this bill reflects our best effort to address our nation's most urgent needs, security and fiscal restraint. I urge my colleagues to support this measure. I look forward to working with you as we move through this bill through the legislative process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin by commending uh, Chairman Carter for leading another open, collaborative, and bipartisan process in constructing the Homeland Security Funding Bill. We'll <coughs> never agree on every funding level, but the Chairman and his staff have consistently worked with our side of the aisle in good faith, uh, have accommodated uh, members of both parties in many, many instances. Assuming the committee is able to avoid the adoption of any poison pill amendments, I'll be supporting the bill today and I encourage my colleagues to do the same. We're fortunate uh, to have a healthy allocation, mm -hmm. especially as it compares to the budget request, uh, which is $887 million lower. More importantly, our allocation is healthy relative to the department's needs, with one major exception related to the classification of most of the National Protection and Programs Directorate as defense spending. We should not forget, however, that our healthy allocation 
comes in the context of wholly inadequate allocations for most of the other subcommittees. As a result, the majority has not invested adequately in the National Science Foundation research in the Commerce Justice Science Bill. Virtually every housing and community development program is under-resourced, and a reasonable labor HHS education bill is not even an option given its 302B allocation. Let me stress, this problem goes beyond the merits of any subcommittee's particular allocation, let alone individual line items. The House majority has stood in the way of the sort of broad budget agreement that balanced the budget in the 1990s. And the House has failed to seriously address the real drivers of the deficit, namely tax expenditures and entitlement spending, instead has returned again and again and again to appropriations, and especially critical domestic investments to bear the whole brunt of deficit reduction. The result's a disaster for our economy and for the work of most of our subcommittees. Let me be clear, I supported the December budget agreement because it gave us some certainty for both the current year and the coming year. It was better than sequestration, it was better than government shutdowns, but I have to say it wasn't all that much better. We're now seeing the consequences of appropriating to an arbitrary number that does not realistically comport to what federal departments and agencies truly need to carry out their essential programs and activities. When the rallying cry of fiscal discipline becomes divorced from the reality of fiscal need, our country is in trouble, and so is the institution in which we serve. All of that being said, the mark before us does address several democratic priorities, including maintaining the current funding level for first responders and anti-terrorism grants, and for research and development activities in support of DHS operations. It provides increases above the request for frontline personnel con conducting critical operations along our borders, protecting our nation's airports, seaports, land ports of entry, coastal waters, commercial air flights, and responding to national dis natural disasters. It provides funding to complete the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility, which will provide significant new research capabilities to help prevent the introduction or the spread of the most serious animal diseases. And it increases funding for critical Coast Guard and CBP Air and Marine acquisitions, improving on the administration's requests, uh, request on, on most of these fronts. The bill also provides additional resources to help the department manage the influx of unaccompanied alien children crossing the southern border, including increases for ICE and CBP that the chairman will be offering as part of uh, a manager's amendment. Most of these additional resources are in response to uh, the delayed letter we received from OMB last Friday, two days after the subcommittee reported the bill, notifying us that the department would need $166 million above the request to manage the number of unaccompanied children expected next year. I urge my colleagues to resist the impulse to draw simple conclusions about the causes of um, this growing problem, uh, there are many reasons for this, uh, or to assume there are simple solutions because there aren't any. What the bill will provide is necessary support for managing the flow of children and aggressively investigating, disrupting, and dismantling the smuggling networks that facilitate it. On the budgeting and acquisition front, I fully endorse the chairman's efforts to ensure that budgets are based on mission requirements and represent comprehensive department-wide perspectives and priorities, and that acquisitions help fill critical capability gaps, and that they're supported by coordinated research, development, testing, and evaluation efforts. Secretary Johnson is pushing hard to move DHS in this direction, and the funding and directives in this bill will facilitate the Secretary's efforts while also holding the Department accountable for delivering. I do have concerns with some of the immigration provisions in the bill. As I've said for many years now, setting an arbitrary minimum of 34,000 ICE detention beds, especially in this fiscal climate, denies ICE the flexibility it needs to manage its enforcement and removal resources and the ability to use cheaper alternative forms of supervision 
when that's appropriate. Ass detention is not punishment. It's a means to ensure the removal of aliens who are flight risks or dangerous to public safety if they are ultimately determined to be removable. Setting an arbitrary minimum of detention beds is a double whammy. It's bad policy. It's wasteful spending. I'm also concerned that some of the other increases above both the current level and the administration's request for ICE enforcement may be excessive. They're especially excessive when compared to other needs and priorities, not only in this bill, but also in the subcommittee bills with insufficient allocations. This bill also provides no funding for the new DHS headquarters already under construction, despite $73 million in the request. We've been told repeatedly by the administration that deferring these investments will greatly increase the project's costs, and I believe they are correct. So I hope we can find a way to address that shortfall later in the process this year. So in closing, I, I want to again underscore my appreciation for the efforts of uh, the chairman and his staff, of our own staff on the uh, minority side, of the full committee uh, chairman and ranking member and, and their staffs. Uh, this has been a cooperative uh, product. Uh, we're proud to bring it before you today. Uh, we've worked uh, through the development of this bill, and we uh, are grateful for um, the effort that it represents to sustain our frontline homeland, homeland security operations and otherwise to secure responsible funding for the coming year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, both the chairman and the ranking member for uh, their hard work on this bill. Uh, they, the subcommittee members and the staff, uh, have, uh, have worked, I think, a good bill. And uh, I chaired this subcommittee for a good number of years. And uh, I know how difficult it is to, to spread the money across a very vast uh, coverage that this bill covers. So you've done a good job. The $39.2 billion uh, in discretionary funding addresses some of the most pressing challenges facing the department. First and foremost, it prioritizes funding for frontline security operations and enforcement uh, to keep our nation secure, to protect against those who seek to do us harm, and to punish those who violate the laws. This includes supporting intelligence and threat targeting activities and acquiring the essential tactical assets needed to support these efforts. Particularly, the bill contains important investments in the fight against cyber threats and illegal narcotics. Beyond these critical frontline efforts, the bill also ensures that FEMA has the resources uh, it needs to provide assistance in the case of natural disasters or other catastrophes. The bill fully funds their stated requirement of $7 billion and provides for important first responder grant programs that provide direct on-the-ground support during emergencies. In addition, the bill uh, takes serious strides to address the, the recent influx of unaccompanied alien children and the obstacles this has presented. Over the last several years, we've seen an exponential rise in the number of undocumented alien children, a tenfold increase from 6,600 uh, in 2011 to 6,600, I'm, th I'm sorry, 66,000 for fiscal year 2014. And the projected number for 2015, even more staggering, 127,000. Uh, clearly, something uh, has to be done. This bill provides $76.9 million above the President's request so that ICE personnel can safely transport these children to HHS Office of Refugee Settlement. Uh, we will all be keeping a close eye on this problem as we uh, consider future appropriations bills to respond to these deep challenges and developments. Uh, the legislation also addresses a number of flaws in the President's budget request. I was heartened to see a budget request that would have left the uh, Coast Guard at a five-year low for drug interdiction, particularly as our nation faces a growing battle against heroin. This legislation denies these cuts. <clears throat> and increases aviation and cutter hours by 5% to 
to continue our battle against illicit drug trafficking in the Caribbean. The President's budget also would have cut critical resources needed by CPB uh, frontline personnel, so this bill includes funding above the request for air and marine operations and border security technology. Lastly, the bill denies the President's proposal to increase aviation passenger security fees and CBP uh, user fees. While tackling these serious issues and sufficiently funding our homeland's first line of defense, this bill actually tallies lower than last year's bill. In total, the bill is $50 million below last year's enacted level, proof of the subcommittee's commitment to weeding out excess, eliminating waste, and making responsible decisions to reduce spending. Cuts were made to uh, lower priority programs and unnecessary increases proposed by the President were denied. For example, uh, the bill trimmed $76.4 million from uh, Coast Guard acquisition funding and denies the consolidation of DHS headquarters, saving the taxpayers $73 million. The bill also continues uh, the strong oversight and close scrutiny of how a DHS spends its resources. This bill truly makes the best use of taxpayer dollars used to protect our homeland and our people. I'm pleased to support the bill, and I ask that you uh, join me in supporting the bill. Now let me turn to full ranking committee member Ms. Loy for her opening remarks on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had the pleasure of serving on this subcommittee, and the bipartisan efforts of his members truly helped to strengthen our security. I thank Chairman Carter and Ranking Member Price, as well as the committee staff, for working together to produce the bill before us today. At about $887.8 million above the administration's request, yet $50 million below current funding levels, this bill would make a series of important investments, including sustaining funding for FEMA's state and local programs at $1.5 billion, including $600 for the UASI program and $466 million for state homeland security grants, maintaining funding for fire grants totaling $340 million for the Safer Grant Program, as well as an additional $340 million for the assistance to firefighter grants to ensure that our first responders have the training and equipment they need to save lives, providing $94.5 million for alternatives to detention, which matches the request and is an increase of $3 million over current funding. I also appreciate the Chairman's efforts to work with me on some of my long-standing priorities, including focusing UASI on urban areas subject to the greatest risk, and support for the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, which has become the go-to center for state and local governments to assess their cyber risk and combat cyber threats. A Coast Guard report on the use of expedited transfers for victims of sexual assault is also in the bill. Too many of our service members have faced this horror, and for many victims, the pain continues as they are forced to be stationed with, and in some cases, work alongside their assailant. Victims of sexual assault in the Coast Guard, like those service in the mil serving in the military, deserve the right to transfer without harming their careers or service. In addition, I'm pleased that the Chairman included an increase of nearly $47.8 million above current funding for ICE domestic investigations, which can be used to combat child exploitation and human trafficking, as well as a requirement that the National Human Trafficking Resource Center hotline be posted in English and Spanish at all U.S. ports of entry. And while this bill takes good steps to fight human trafficking and the tragic increase in unaccompanied alien children at our borders, $205.7 million 
is unnecessarily set aside for the misguided policy of mandating a set number of detention beds, which wastes valuable money that could best be used elsewhere to protect our nation. In closing, I reiterate my appreciation for the Chairman's efforts. This is a reasonable bill that I hope will remain free from poison bill riders. I know the Chairman and Ranking Member share my hope that agencies tasked with these vital security functions get responsible funding levels. And I thank you. Thank the gentlelady. Mr. Chairman. Is there further remarks in Mr. general? Chairman. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Chairman, I'll be brief. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Judge Carter and Professor Price for putting this bill together. Uh, I served on this committee and I know the challenges before the committee, and it's to the main challenge that I want to speak to very briefly, and that is that this bill has a lot of issues that it deals with, uh, homeland security issues, issues of the terrorism, issues of uh, first responders, issues we all support. But there's a tendency in this subcommittee at times, and I saw it, to deal with immigrants and the immigration issue in a way where it could become more and more this committee that takes the shots, if you will, the bad shots at immigrants. I, like everyone else, agree that there is an immigration issue. Notice I don't call it a problem. It's an immigration issue. A nation of immigrants can never have an immigration problem. It can have an issue. And we will continue to deal with that issue. And of course, the solution to it is comprehensive immigration reform, which this committee then later will have to work with uh, in different ways. But whether that happens or not, I would just warn ourselves to be careful that in how we deal with this subcommittee, we don't take it more on the road of being the committee that uh, spends a lot of time, or most of its time, dealing with how people cross the border or don't cross the border or what that issue is. I may remind you that at times this committee was in charge of building a fence, something which I personally found so offensive that the greatest country on earth will build a fence against the southern border. And yet, when my city of New York was hit by terrorists on 9-11, it was people who had entered the country through the northern border, not through the southern border. In fact, many of them had come in with visas and overstayed their visas to commit their crimes. And so in closing, and at the expense of being repetitious, let us do our work on this committee. Let us do the work we have to do. But let us make sure that we understand the challenge that confronts us is that this subcommittee, the Homeland Security Subcommittee, cannot become the committee that spends most of its time uh, uh, knocking people who come here for a better life, but rather that it finds a way to deal with that issue and deal with it properly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Lady from Washington State. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first I'd like to <coughs> congratulate Chairman Carter and Ranking Member Price on producing a great bill that I plan to vote for. Um, I'm particularly grateful for the report language that you all have helped us put in um, that specifically urges the Coast Guard <coughs> to comply with some congressional inquiries regarding, uh, regarding the Columbia River Crossing Bridge. Um, rather than often offer an amendment and try and go after certain things within the Coast Guard leadership, I think this is the right approach for now. I'm really hopeful that they're going to heed this report language. A little bit of background, the Columbia River Crossing is one of the most controversial, one of the most controversial uh, projects, transportation projects in the northwestern United States. Um, for a few, few important reasons, set aside the moment that every time it's been voted on <laughs> by voters in the region, they've rejected it, um, or that it has had none of the state level requisite funding. Um, the biggest kicker was that the clearance for this bridge was too short to allow for current river traffic. Um, it serves Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, and the Columbia River is over a billion dollars worth of ag industry coming down that river, and the bridge that, that they were pushing um, is too short for that, that commerce to take place. So 
we, so in spite of all this, um, rather than leave the permitting to the Seattle region, the Coast Guard took the unprecedented step of removing authority for permitting that bridge from Seattle and brought it to headquarters, making it what I feel like was a very political um, uh, uh, push to permit no matter what. And so last year I sent a, a letter to the Coast Guard. I requested their internal and external communications on this subject. Um, I believe that the uh, authorizing committee has also made inquiries. We have gotten, we have not gotten that information and it's been nine months. I got some external information, but I cannot believe that there has been no communication, not one email sent between Coast Guard employees in this whole permitting time that they ended up permitting, um, that they, they just don't have that information. So my hope is that with this report language, the Coast Guard will pay attention. Um, they have ignored FOIA requests from citizens. We want the information about why that move has taken place, and we're hopeful um, to work with you as this bill moves through the process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I really uh, appreciate your time. There being no further general discussion, are there amendments? <coughs> Judge Carter. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I rise to offer this bipartisan management Amendment, manager's amendment labeled Carter number one, and I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized to explain. As I talked about and stated in my opening remarks, this amendment includes a carefully constructed bipartisan agreement to address the known and projected costs associated with the management of unaccompanied alien children or UACs, as we refer to them. Ranking Member Price and I worked diligently together on crafting this agreement, an agreement we can, we had, that we had to forge in less than a week thanks to a very poorly timed and amateur work of the OMB. Ms. Robor Allard, Mr. Cuellar, and Mr. Cole deserve credit for their constructive and thoughtful input on the UAC agreement, which includes not only the necessary funding for the management of the spiraling influx of UAC tra seas transmitting our southwestern border, but substantial oversight, oversight and reporting requirements as well. I should add that this UAC agreement does come at, the cost, at a cost to DHS. The poorly constructed FY15 budget request that was compounded by a late and incomplete letter on the resource shortfall associated with the processing and management of UACs. These funding trade-offs are clearly explained within the amendment before you. Finally, this manager's amendment includes a number of other technical corrections to the bill and report, as well as additional non-controversial items intended to accommodate concerns of several members of the committee. We tried to help every member who came to us with constructive input since our subcommittee markup. Finally, this manager's amendment includes two technical corrections on the Coast Guard's military pay to align with bipartisan 1.8% pay raise funded by the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee and authorized by the House Armed Services Committee and to reflect updated scoring by CBO on retired prey. I thank the ranking member and other members for their input and I urge the committee's prompt adoption of this bipartisan amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to answer any questions anyone has about this amendment, and I'm prepared to yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Price. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I want to commend the chairman and the staff for the uh, rather rapid and, uh, and uh, cooperative work that uh, this amendment required, this manager's amendment required. It is indeed a cooperative product, and I urge adoption. So for the discussion, Mrs. Washerman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Um, I also rise in uh, support of the manager's amendment. I want to thank Chairman Carter and Ranking Member Price uh, for a number of things. First, the language that references uh, the um, CBP agency uh, to make sure that we can keep pressure on them to continually reassess and improve their staffing model so that we can fairly and efficiently allocate CBP officers to ports of entry. Uh, where there is the greatest pressure and the greatest need, particularly Miami International Airport. Um, I also want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for, uh, for uh, including language uh, regarding GAO's ongoing review of the secure credentials at DHS and other agencies. Since the government printing office is the in-government printer for 
many government documents and credentials. Chairman Cole and I on the Legislative Branch Appropriations Subcommittee have been paying very close attention to this issue, and I hope to continue to work with you on this as the bill moves forward and goes to conference and we get the results of the GAO review. And lastly, I uh, especially want to thank the Chairman and the Ranking Member uh, uh, for their continued leadership on combating child exploitation, because that has been a top priority of this entire committee. Um, there are significant resources in this bill for ICE's various child exploitation programs. In fact, I think most people in America don't know how deeply involved ICE is in combating child exploitation, and uh, it's absolutely critical that we continue to be able to protect our most vulnerable, which are our children. So with that, I yield back the balance of my time in support of the amendment. Thank you. Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, I want to thank uh, Chairman Carter, uh, Ranking Member of Mayor Price, and certainly the Soviet Chairman and, and uh, Rita Lari, and of course the staff that worked so hard. As you know, I uh, talking about the UAPs, uh, that pretty much is happening in my southern part of my congressional district. So it, in fact, this uh, coming Saturday, I'll be there to visit the facilities. And I want to thank uh, the Chairman and both the Ranking Member for, for the great work that they did here. What, what I would like to do is continue working with the committee because, as you know, we're, this is only what we're doing at the one yard line, the U.S. Mexico border. We still got to work with uh, 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 Chairwoman uh, Kay Ranger and, of course, Nina Lowry on the foreign operations as to what we do before we get there. But I, I would like to just mention just a couple of things. You know the numbers every day in, in South Texas catching 1,200 uh, individuals, and this is the ones that they catch, uh, and three to 400 are unaccompanied kids. It takes about two hours to process those individuals. And if you multiply by the number of people, imagine what's happening with the Border Patrol. They're, they're either filling out paperwork, transporting, feeding, and it's men and women that are doing a great job that are not at the border, securing the border. So imagine what's happening to the drugs that are being moved. And remember, the, drugging, uh, the, the smuggling organizations are the ones that are making the decisions to send them to this particular area. But I want to just bring up two points that I think I, I want all the members to know what's happening. Let me first talk about uh, UAPs. They're, they're, they're caught down there in South Texas, and then either a commercial flight, a Coast Guard. Remember, they use the Coast Guard. Uh, that's air traffic that can be used to stop drugs coming in, train or buses. And they're being sent off either to eventually the end, end up at a ORR uh, facility. Blackland uh, has 1,200. Uh, uh, capacity. Ventura uh, facility there in Oxford, uh, California has a capacity of 575. Fort Sill, Oklahoma has a capacity of about 600. Some of them are being sent off to Baltimore. They fly off to Baltimore, Washington International Airport, Richmond <coughs> International Airport, and then from there they're sent to the Baltimore OR facility of uh, 500. Uh, St. Paul College uh, facility has another 500 and other ORC facilities that have not been disclosed to us. So there are, of course, the UATs, the unaccompanied kids. They're going to try to find family members or somebody to take care of them, uh, and they're going to be released. Now, the other thing that I want you to understand is the family unit. And this is something that really surprised me, Mr. Carr, with the list of this, that this affects us in Texas. At, in, in the Laredo area, in, or in the Laredo area, in the last 18 days, they have released 2,300 uh, members of family units, mothers and kids in Laredo, in my hometown. In the Del Rio area, about a thousand in the last 30 days. And this is in the bus stations there. Uh, the Rio Grande, uh, in the last 60 days, they have relieved 8,000 individuals. Mm. So this is after Border Patrol has <coughs> catched them, has caught them, they're being relieved in our backyard. And this doesn't include their possibly, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Uh, and you can imagine there. So just it, from the real down, in the last 60 days, they've released about 11,000 individuals. So Border Patrol catches them, and this family units are being released. These are not on a of kids. I just explained what happened to those kids. These are a family unit. And the reason I mentioned this is it doesn't include Apostle, it doesn't include Tucson, Arizona. So as we move forward, and again, I, I thank the chairman and, 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 and the ranking member and the other folks that worked so hard. I want to continue working with you because there is a gap that after our if men and women in green are doing their job, there's a gap there where we got to get those immigration judges, either associates or new ones to come in because there's a gap where, as you know, they're given a piece of paper to show up. And again, I can, I can uh, have you guess 
that once they traveled thousands of miles, paid thousands of dollars, went through very uh, violent situations, do you think they are going to show up after a while, but when they're given the piece of paper? And again, I'll, I'll let you answer that question. But again, I, I want to thank the chairman, the ranking member, uh, Nita, uh, 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 the ranking uh, woman, also Ms. Laurie, and of course the chairman, everybody. We got to continue working uh, with uh, with y'all. And again, I'm also not very happy with the administration because to, for them to give us this number, uh, either they withheld some of this information or they just didn't know what the heck was happening down there at the uh, at the border. So again, I want to thank all uh, thank all of y'all for the great job, and I look forward to working with y'all. Yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I rise first to. Uh, Say that most of our conversation here tends to be about the southern border. Uh, I happen to live along the northern border, uh, and that border represents our interaction between our largest trading partner. As Mr. Serrano pointed out, uh, we've had a significant number of threats that have evolved in Canada uh, from, from, uh, from uh, folks who have immigrated uh, from the Middle East. And I think that as we move forward, and I urge you, uh, because this will be my last participation in the DHS uh, budget process and appropriations process, uh, that you continue to focus on the northern border. It is both in our economic interest and in our security interest. Uh, so as you move forward and do the good work that you do every day, uh, please keep that in mind and make sure that we uh, are paying attention to our northern neighbors. There being no further discussion, the question is on the manager's amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed will say no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Schiff. Chairman, I have an amendment for that. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Schiff. At the appropriate place in the bill under the item relating to U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, insert the following. A, none of the funds made available in this act may be used by U.S. Immigration. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized. Chairman, I uh, am offering this amendment with Ms. Uh, Woodball Allard to limit funds made available for the deportation of the parents of U.S. citizens or lawful permanent resident minor children. Our current immigration system is broken. I think we all know that. And until we can come together to act on a comprehensive immigration reform bill, there's a humanitarian crisis that we need to address, and it is this. We are deporting the parents of American kids. Inaction hurts our friends and neighbors, damages our economy, and undermines our national security. Worst of all, it has exacted a terrible toll on innocent families and children. Over 5.5 million children who themselves are in this country legally as citizens or lawful permanent residents have at least one undocumented parent. And the stress caused by the fear of deportation or actual deportation of a parent places enormous strain, as you can imagine, on that child's well-being. It disrupts their developmental process and negatively impacts their educational outcomes. Reports that have shown that a large number of children with undocumented parents are either afraid all or most of the time are anxious and exhibited symptoms of enormous stress. But we don't need to say studies to say what we all know. Family separation can be catastrophic for children in critical stages of development. I want us all to imagine uh, for a moment that we were born here, that we were a child here, and that we live every day in fear that the government is going to take our parents away. That is the reality for millions of kids, and I'm talking about American kids. The amendment I'm offering with Ms. Wibble Allard would protect American children, U.S. citizens, and legal permanent residents who are at risk of losing their parents. This amendment is limited to immigrants with strong ties to community and who pose no risk to public safety. It is something that I hope we can all agree on. I want to emphasize, particularly in light of the events of the last couple of weeks, that this amendment has nothing to do with the unaccompanied minor issue that Mr. Quello was just talking about and we've been talking about at length, which will have to be dealt with separately. This is a completely separate issue that deals with U.S. citizen children uh, and the risk that their parents are going to be taken away from them. It focuses only on keeping the families of U.S. citizen and lawful permanent resident children together. The 
colleagues, I'd urge you to consider the harmful effects of breaking up the families of innocent American children. Uh, I hope you'll join in supporting these families and keeping them together and protecting our youngest and most vulnerable constituents. Uh, as chairman, I have a, a letter of support from the California Table for Immigration Reform and also like to uh, have the incorporated in my remarks. Without objection. Judge Carter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Schiff has, has raised one of the many, many issues that need to be addressed in immigration reform, uh, but this is not an immigration reform bill. This is a spending bill, and I think this is a, in a, inappropriate here, and so I, I acknowledge the need for immigration reform. Uh, I think that immigration reform will be on the table one of these days, but is it appropriate? But this is not an appropriate place, and so uh, I oppose this amendment. Ms. Roy Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, fir first of all, I, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the heartfelt concern that uh, Chairman Carter uh, has with regards to the unaccompanied children that are entering uh, this country. And I, I do want to thank him for uh, working with us in a bipartisan way to make sure that these children are treated in a respectful and compassionate way. Uh, I rise in, uh, in strong support of Congressman Schiff's uh, amendment, which, as he said, is, is very narrowly defined to American, uh, to the parents of American children and those who are here uh, legally. And I agree with Chairman Carter that this issue would be better addressed uh, with uh, comprehensive immigration reform. But that's not going to happen. And these children can, cannot wait until we get around to doing that. Their families uh, and, and their lives are being impacted right now. Uh, and what, one of the things that, that is in, in important to note is that what is happening with some of these US American children is that because their parents are being deported, Right now, we have approximately 5,000 American children who are currently in the child welfare system because of the deportation of a parent. And in addition, according to a study, that the, the fear of losing a parent through deportation has a number of negative consequences for the mental health of these American children, including severe anxiety and withdrawal. So I think it's important that you know, we put, uh, the, this is not a, an immigration issue. Uh, as appropriators, uh, we are not dealing with policy. What Mr. Adam uh, Schiff's amendment does is actually say that money that we appropriate cannot be used to uh, de deport the parents of these children who, and it's clear, who pose no threat to our communities or to our country. So I believe that we do have uh, uh, authority uh, as members of the Appropriation uh, Committee to, to direct how this money can or cannot be used. And I hope that you will support uh, Mr. Schiff's uh, amendment uh, to, to help these American children uh, stay with their families, not be put into foster home, and not to live under the stressful conditions in which they are living today. I yield back. Is there further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Serrano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, Judge Carter made a statement and which spoke to my earlier statement. And I'm not trying to contradict him, just to point it out. He said this is not an immigration bill. But this bill does make immigration decisions. What well, Mr. Schiff is uh, addressing, which I wholeheartedly support, is an immigration issue. Now, a couple of years ago, I asked for a report, and, and uh, Ms. Royal Allard was involved, and she has followed this issue up strongly. And we found in that report that 100,000 parents had been deported. What's interesting about that, and what's really a legal question here, is that some of those children then were placed in foster homes. Some of those children were basically put under the care of the state and became what some people would call a welfare case. But some children went back with their parents because there was no other choice. 
technically, and I'm not a constitutional lawyer, we deported American citizens. Because if those children went back with their parents and they were born here, we in fact are deporting American citizens. And that is not only an improper use of the language, it is illegal and improper and unconstitutional. And so this issue goes much, much deeper. Now I have a bill that's been around for a thousand years. We all have a bill that doesn't go anywhere where I simply say let judges be judges. Let judges determine case by case whether a person should be deported that has an American, a child that was born in this country. But my last point was my initial, my, my earlier point, that we may have in fact, well we have in fact, deported American citizens in these situations and that's something that someday may come to haunt us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judge Carter is right. This is an appropriations committee, and we don't legislate on appropriations bills, except when we make exceptions to that, and we have done it. I think this issue, which uh, has been brought up, is, is one It's a very serious problem. And I don't think you understand how serious it is until you have people confronting you where they're given notices that they've got to leave the country and, they've got, and, they, and they have to, what do they do with their children? It's a panic, it's a panic situation. It, it disrupts the entire community. It disrupts the workers, the employers uh, who are employing these people. And I think what you're asking is just for a delay in, uh, in getting, you know, it's costly to deport them. Uh, but they haven't really committed a crime other than they don't have the papers to be here. And we're going to have a process to do that. But I think if this is a, if it is an emergency and we ought to use this legislation to address that emergency. The gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I think it's no secret that all of you know that I've been working on this issue for a long time. I was work I've been working on this issue when the Democrats controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House. And unfortunately, for a number of different reasons, either the leadership couldn't get it done or didn't want to get it done. And I'm still working on it. Uh, I understand what the sponsor is trying to do. Uh, just a word of caution. If we're going to get this done, and I hope that we will, because everybody recognizes that we have a broken immigration system, it's going to have to be done in a bipartisan, very delicate, very well thought out way. My fear is that well-intentioned well things like this could be misinterpreted as an attempt to not follow the law. And there are folks on both sides of the aisle that will use any excuse to try to derail the good faith efforts to try to get the system fixed. So I understand what you're saying. We understand that there are American citizens, kids, whose parents are being deported because that's what the law says that we're supposed to do it. Uh, I understand all of our frustration because we have the president who has been called by responsible organizations of the porter in chief. I understand the frustration that we have a broken system. I think all of us understand that. My only concern is whether this would have the effect of potentially, whatever chances we have of getting it done, potentially derailing it. I know not, that's not why you're trying to do it, but that's my fear. So I would ask respectfully, as one, no secret where I am on this issue, that has worked very hard and continues to work very hard on this. If you would consider, as opposed to going through the appropriations process, working with us, those of us who are working in a bipartisan level, to try to get this done, to avoid the risk of potentially derailing something that may have or may not have a chance. I think it still does. So I'm not asking you to withdraw it. I'm just saying think about the potential that you might be hurting what you're trying to help. And I would ask you to, instead of doing it through this appropriations process in this way, to agree to work with those of us who are willing to take the heat and who are willing to work in a bipartisan way to get this done. I respectfully ask you to consider that because I know you're not trying to do that, but potentially you could be putting at risk 
efforts that you know have been going on for a long time. And that would be, frankly, uh, very sad. Ms. Kaptur. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the uh, SHIP amendment. Uh, I think, first of all, it's pro-family. And um, if each of us looks at the casework that we handle in our offices uh, related to this issue, the tragedies come one after another. Uh, it's also, uh, I think, supportive of economic growth. And uh, to keep families together, to keep people working, it's pro-education because you don't uh, um, put these burdens on these children whose, whose parents' lives uh, are at risk. And I, I just wanted to, um, I wish the gentleman had in his amendment the phrase, or married to a U.S. citizen, prohibits the use of funds to deport the parent of a child who is a legal resident of the United States or married to a U.S. citizen, because I have actually cases in my office where, and I'll mention the first one, a Korean couple, South Korean couple, uh, that runs a very successful restaurant in Ohio. Uh, the husband was deported uh, to South Korea and, of course, creating great anxiety inside the family, front page stories for months, literally in our local newspapers. And uh, for what the man should be a citizen. Uh, and um, uh, the, the havoc that that just one case created uh, in our region. Each of you members can probably think of cases in your region. I remember another case in my region where I went to a company where a mother was cleaning bathrooms and had done so for a very long time, and I went through the high school that was adjacent to this company, and I was congratulating the kids for graduating, and I was saying to them, what are you going to do next year? And I came up to this one girl, and I said, congratulations to you, uh, and what are you going to do next year? And she was the child of someone who was working, but not a U.S. citizen, and she completely broke down in tears. And the pressure, what Adam says about the pressure on the children is just so uh, unfair. I think of another gentleman, a family, uh, the husband from Lebanon, the wife from the United States. They're, they're married. They've been married for years. Their kids are in college. He's always under the threat of deportation, and he runs one of the most important businesses on the west side of Cuyahoga County in Ohio, and I'm going, when is this going to be over so that these families can live a normal life? It's like they, they live with a guillotine. They, they can never actually function normally. In our, and these are all productive people. They're all running businesses. They are all educating their children. And uh, some of them are married to U.S. citizens. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So I think the gentleman's amendment is very um, uh, narrowly crafted. Uh, and it would relieve the pressure uh, on these families, but also on our offices in trying to handle this netherworld in which these individuals live. So I think it's a constructive step. And I uh, heard what Congressman diaz Ballard said uh, during this hearing. The great thing about this amendment today is that it at least allows us to talk to one another. We don't get much of a chance to do it unless we're on some committee uh, that deals with this, uh, with this subject. But there is an immediate need here in almost every congressional district. I think it's a productive amendment. It's pro-family. We should support it. Ms. Lee. to have been torn apart and separated. Over 2000, in, in 2012, over 88,500 immigrants with a United States citizen child were deported from this country with over 5.5 million American children with at least one undocumented parent. They fear uncertainty, and they really worry about uh, the lives of far too many people who shouldn't really have to worry about their lives here. This amendment would provide some much needed certainty for those families until, of course, the Republican leadership allows us to bring up comprehensive immigration reform, which I believe we have the votes to pass. 
we need, quite frankly, a long-term solution that provides a pathway to citizenship for 11 million undocumented Americans and unites families or reunites families. So I want to thank my colleagues for introducing this important amendment, which I'm proud to support. We all care about uh, family values, and this amendment really does give us an opportunity uh, to demonstrate that very clearly in this committee. Thank you, and I urge support of this amendment. Mr. Pastor. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I rise in support of this amendment. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, I would tell my, my friend from uh, Florida that my intent is not to derail immigration reform because it's much needed. Uh, I saw what happened in the 80s when immigration reform was passed and uh, people were able to become citizens and were able now to live a, a great life in this country without uh, the cloud being over their head. So I'm very much uh, for immigration reform. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I still have the expectation and the hope that this House will take up uh, immigration reform and hopefully in the last uh, few days that I'm in this session I'll be able to vote for some legislation that will uh, bring uh, reform and uh, clarity to our immigration reform. But uh, after yesterday's stunner, uh, I don't know. <laughs> So I get up, Mr. Chairman, to speak uh, uh, for this amendment because I have to tell you that uh, the majority of my casework now is dealing uh, with a situation where you have a uh, family member or both parents uh, being picked up. And in Arizona, you, as you well know, uh, we've had uh, uh, checkpoints and uh, raids and uh, probably more than anywhere else uh, in this country. And what has happened is that uh, in many cases, uh, people who are working at a car wash or at a restaurant or uh, at an office uh, were picked up. And uh, the reality is that these people have been here for many years. They're not recent uh, uh, arrivals. Many have been here for a number of years and living here under the shadows, they have had children who are U.S. citizens and many are going to school and, and doing well in school. But they live with a constant fear of, uh, uh, of, be of being picked up. And the kids, they're trying to go to school, and they live with the fear of coming home and finding that their parents are gone. Uh, INS has a process. If they uh, pick up uh, uh, parents uh, or individuals uh, who uh, are no threat to the security of this country or don't have a political record, and in uh, and, and all... Uh, the probability is uh, they haven't cre cre uh, committed serious felonies. Uh, they have the discretion of allowing them to stay here. And I've worked many of those cases, but in many of those cases, it was because an advocacy group brought the parents over or because I was able to seek them out. Now, what this would do, and um, so the process is in place, so I think what this would do would allow uh, INS to be able to, uh, to have this discretion that they have to be affirmed that uh, if someone who uh, is a parent of a U.S. citizen, and I agree with uh, Marcy that possibly a, a spouse of a U.S. citizen who is not a threat, who has not created a, a, a felony and uh, has lived here for many years without causing any problems, that that person uh, should uh, be allowed to remain here for a period of time, and you can define the period of time, with the expectation that this Congress one day will do immigration reform, and so that that person then can go through the process and become legalized. And I think uh, all of us are either parents or grandparents or spouses, and I don't know how we would handle uh, having our children or our grandchildren being removed. But that is the difficulty that people are facing every day throughout this country. So I would ask you in your, uh, in your humane, humane manner that you might consider adopting this amendment so that uh, you would remove this cloud from U.S. citizens who have the biggest fear that their parents are going to be removed and uh, and they'll have this trauma in their life that may then cause more problems in the future. 
So I yield back. Mr. Honda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just feel compelled to um, stand and address this body uh, on this issue. I support the amendment, and I think that every comment that was made today, this morning, were honest comments, were honest um, uh, and based upon your own sense of what is right and what is wrong. But there's a difference between um, what is what is law and what is constitutional. I think many of us have experiences in our lives, in our history in this country, uh, whether we're native born, Native Americans, brought here over slave ships, or being here as immigrants like my grandparents were. And then things happen in this country that lawmakers start to <coughs> look at issues and split the question. We seem to divide the question on what is constitutional and what is a citizen and what are their rights. And I think that um, we had many opportunities in this body over the past few years to be able to define what a citizen is and what their rights are. And, but we always have this thing called, but it's not legal. Well, I, I think that we as adults with a lot of experiences and insights can determine what sometimes legal may not be constitutional. And if we look at our history and we look at the Constitution, we look at the wordings there, I, I'm not sure that in the Constitution we divide the term persons by age. Since the adoption of the Constitution, we started to define what that person looks like, what their gender is, what their orientation is, what their age is. But the Constitution didn't make that distinction. I'm not a constitutional lawyer. I'm just a simple school teacher. And it seems to me that if we are born in this country under the Constitution, that we have every right and protection of the Constitution, regardless of our age, regardless of our station, regardless of where we, regardless of our birth, uh, place in, in, this, in this country, regardless of our zip codes. So I allow myself with uh, Mr. Pastor, not only his words, but his sentiment that seems to be coming out, and that our ability to divide the question is the thing that happens all the time in this country when it comes to citizenship and what is what is the right thing for us to do? In 1942, we divided the question whether it was constitutional or not to put Japanese Americans into camps based upon executive order, based upon curfew, based upon military necessity, based upon national security, based upon personal security. We divided the question whether it was constitutional to take citizens, 120,000 persons, two-thirds of them were U.S. citizens. I was one year old, but I was a U.S. citizen. My grandfather was not a citizen because he could not become a citizen because of the law that we passed that said Asians could not become citizens in this country because of a federal law that we passed. So today, I think that we have a great opportunity to dis dis discuss the opportunities that we have before us and to understand that maybe we should start really thinking about what is right, what is conscience, based upon in our understanding of the Constitution, and not divide the constitutional question of what is a citizen and what rights do they have. I appreciate this time. And I appreciate your, your attention. I yield back. Chairman Wolf. I yield to the chairman, uh, Congressman Carter. I just want to point out one more thing as we discuss this. And, and I think all of our colleagues here would know that our friends on the Judiciary Committee are probably going to take strong exception to this amendment. And that's another reason that I do. 
And so, uh, once again, I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. Uh, Mr. Yield back. Mr. Dent. Yeah, um, I wasn't going to say anything on this, on this amendment, but uh, uh, before I came down here on Monday, I was at my son's high school graduation. And as I was being seated by the usher, I recognized him. He said, Charlie, great to see you. Got me to my seat and said, hey, can you help me with my, my, my brother? You know, he's in Syria. Uh, you know, of course, we're citizens. Uh, they got to get out of the country. We can't get them out. Things are terrible. And, you know, my staff spends about a third of their time dealing with immigration issues, largely from South Asia and also Syria, the largest Syrian population of any member of Congress in the country. And I get refugee requests all the time. We're trying to reunite families, people in the citizens in the United States or green card holders trying to bring their families who are trying to escape a, a, a god-awful situation. And I appreciate the intent of what's being done here about trying to unnecessarily separate families. I'm trying to help reunite families and I'd like to use this process too to maybe figure out a way to help some of my constituents get their family members in the United States. And I'd like to do it in this process but I don't think I can do it in an appropriations bill. I have concerns about doing this type of immigration reform in, in the appropriations bill. I, like many have said, I think we need to deal with this issue in a strong way uh, and, uh, and we shouldn't ignore it. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I think all of us in this room are dealing with immigration in a very big way. I know I am, and, um, and uh, we have to make some very hard decisions. And uh, I, I, would, I would just respectfully suggest there's a, probably a better place to deal with this type of very real problem. Thank you. Mr. Chair. The gentleman from California, uh, uh, Wisconsin. If not, now when? That's what this, co this is coming down to. Um, immigration reform has been, been talked about as, as, as you know, we're, we're doing immigration reform on this bill. Well. I'm going to share a story of a constituent family. Um, they were refugees from Laos. And as refugees, the Hmong who fought along with their soldiers and families were divided up, countries also divided where, where families were going to be, and clans. So we had a family that was uh, in Minnesota, a family that was in California, and a family that was in France. All the same clan, all united. The Hmong travel among countries. They travel among states. So this family came to California. They had been originally assigned to another country. They came legally to California. They started some paperwork in California <coughs> to become citizens. They were working with an immigration attorney. Well, things pass, and you know, Hmong was not a written language. Uh, these people were very dependent upon the word and being told by attorneys and people taking their money about what they could and could not do. Years progress. They joined family in Minnesota. Fast forward 16 years later. They have a son who's going to graduate from, from high school, accepted into college, been working part time. 9-11 has happened, and now ICE is looking through all the records very, very carefully, and lo and behold, this family who had bought a house, raised children, had helped uh, our soldiers during the Vietnam War, all of a sudden found themselves not being able to attend their son's high school graduation who was born here in the United States. So folks, we need to get this fixed in so many ways because it's beyond the immigration policy that everybody's dancing around here right now. It is much bigger than that on families who are being split across in this country. And so to Mr. Schiff's amendment, I want to be able to say no more families being ripped apart with U.S. children at high school graduations anymore. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much. I would just ask the offer of the amendment. I would yield, uh, and I'm going to yield some time to him to answer a question. The way this is, um, and look, I understand. I understand the compassion issue, and you know the argument was made. Maybe we should, we should in fact give more discretion on a case by case basis. But the way this is drafted, when I was a, uh, you know, on the academic faculty, I would write support for J-1 visas for people to come in, highly skilled people. A lot of times they're young. They come in. They come in with their family. They have a child. The way this is written, 
This would actually prohibit uh, home, uh, immigration and customs from enforcing a J-1 visa a, a deadline. Is that correct? I mean, if somebody hit the end of their J-1 visa deadline and they have given birth, you know, their wife or they, if they're, they're a woman, they've given birth, we would stop enforcement of legal people here illegally, right? I mean, the H-2B workers in my district who pick, pick crab meat. I mean, if they have a child here or have a child while they're here, this would stop enforcement of actually that visa because we couldn't remove them. Is that correct, the way it's worded? This is not only for people who are here illegally, but it's actually for people on legal visas. Is that correct, the way it's written? That person comes in on a J-1, they have a child, they have their, you know, they're doing their research at the Academic Medical Center. This allows them to stay. If your question is, if your question is whether among the five and a half million kids in America who are either American citizens or legal residents, um, does this affect a very small sliver uh, whose parent may be here, um, not as an undocumented person, but as a documented person? Yes. It's not theoretical because, I mean, I've had the situation where I have people come, and thank you very much, and I thank you, and I reclaim the time. Mr. Chairman, this goes well beyond illegal, people here illegally. This goes to Immigration and Customs being able to enforce people who are legally here temporarily on temporary visas, whether it's a J-1, an H-2B, any of the temporary visas. We know a lot of those workers, in fact, at some point have a child who's in the United States, given birth in the United States, and they have birthright citizenship. This ties the hands to actually enforce, I mean, I can't imagine how hard it now becomes for immigration to actually enforce legal visas. So I think the scope is perhaps broader than it should have been, and I yield back the time. The uh, gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield my time. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. I, we've heard a lot now. Look, to Mr. Pastor's statement, I know your intention. I know you want to get this done before you leave. There's no doubt in my mind. I will tell you, and I know, Mr. Schiff, that your intentions are well. I know you very well. You're an honorable man. I will tell you there are others, and you know, in this process of either party, that have tried to use this issue as a political issue. Not to try to get it done, but to try to stir up the emotions. I know that's not what you're trying to do. And if you bring it forward and you ask for a vote, which I hope you don't do, ask for a vote, I'll be there with you. But I will tell you this. I ask of you very respectfully. If this were to pass, let me tell you what I know will happen. This will become a politicized issue on the floor. It will become a divisive issue on the floor. And it will hurt those of us who are in a bipartisan way trying to get this done. And those, not you all, not you two, but others who when the Democrats had an opportunity, refused to speak up, will then use this as a political issue. And those who on our side and the Republican side refused to want to get this done, will use this as a political issue as well. So I'm just pleading with you. I know you're well-intentioned. But my fear is you're going to be allowing this issue to become even more politicized. So I plead with you, if you really want to get this done, work with those of us. Speak to Luis Gutierrez. Speak to myself. Work with us to try to get this done, to lower the rhetoric, to lower the passions, because if we're going to get this done, that's what we need to do. And I will tell you, I'll vote with you. If that's what you insist, and if you ask for a vote, and then it'll demonstrate that you're actually trying this, to do this not to get it done, but to politicize it. Um, but if that's the case, uh, then you're going to be hurting us. So I plead with you, as opposed to do that, work with us. We need to lower the passions. So I hope that's what you'll do. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With all due respect to my colleagues, I don't know how this can become more political, and I don't know how this issue can become more emotional, not just in this uh, house, but in this country. Uh, so in the end, we've got to ask ourselves, why did we come here? In the end, we came here to do what we think is right. And I think with the greatest respect, 
we have to be willing to do what we think is right, and, and you may disagree on how that happens, but we have to be willing to risk our jobs to do what we think is right. I know that's easy to say, but I think last night there's pretty strong evidence uh, of that. So, uh, and I'll, I'll say this, I don't necessarily see those folks trying to get this done because in, it's my belief that if the Senate bill was on the floor, it would pass. Uh, you know, I, I know I wouldn't get a, a lot of votes on, on your, your side, but I do believe it would get 218 votes and it would pass and we would move forward. So uh, I know this is an emotional issue. I know it's a tough political one. I think what you're seeing is some frustration with amendments like this and the one I'm going to propose, perhaps withdraw later on, because we have no other outlet. With all due respect, we don't get to decide what goes on the floor. We can sign discharge petitions, but that's all. So I, I'm just trying to tell you, this is our only outlet to try to solve this extraordinary problem, even if it's one small step at a time. And perhaps with a little bit of humor by someone much smarter and funnier than me, let me put how I see this issue on a larger uh, basis. Uh, a very funny man, Stephen Colbert, testified before Congress, and he said, my grandfather didn't come across 4,000 miles of the Atlantic Ocean to live in a nation overrun with immigrants. I don't know if that helps put it into perspective. I know how tough this issue is for everyone, but in the end, I think it's going to take some pound of flesh, but we have to move forward and do the right thing. Thank you. I'll yield back. Ms. Wasman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't want to repeat uh, much of what has been said already, uh, but I really believe that this is probably our only opportunity to move this issue forward at all, and I have tremendous respect for my, my personal friend. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, and know how involved and engaged he's been on this issue, and, and he knows how committed to it uh, I am as well. We both represent a community where uh, making sure that families are not torn apart is one of the most important issues that we deal with uh, every single day for the families that we represent. Um, I don't think we should uh, delude ourselves at all that, uh, that we are going to have pre precious few opportunities to ensure that we can make some progress, that both sides of the aisle uh, continue to at least say verbally that we want to make. Um, this is our opportunity. And to the gentleman from Maryland, uh, you know, where he says that this is written more broadly than the, than the sponsor intends, um, I mean, to me, uh, no matter <laughs> uh, illegal, uh, illegal or undocumented, um, there isn't a situation when unless there is clear and convincing evidence that the alien poses a clear risk to national security, that parents and children should be torn apart, whether their parents are here legally or undocumented. And let's take this opportunity. Let's show that we actually do have bipartisan support to make sure that we can make some small progress on this issue and then build off of that progress. Uh, this is the opportunity for us to show the entire country that we really aren't so unbelievably polarized that we can't at least agree that parents and children should not be torn apart when there is no risk to this country uh, that, that, is, that, is moved, that, is, uh, that is risked in that, in that instance. So thank you. I yield back. Mr. Price. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I rise in support of the amendment. I uh, want to say just a word about uh, the context here, though, and uh, uh, explain that I take this position with some ambivalence. Um, no ambivalence whatsoever about the content of the amendment. I think uh, Mr. Schiff is absolutely right. Uh, we shouldn't be tearing families apart in this country through our immigration uh, policy, and uh, if, there's pos if it's possible to stop it today, we should do so. It's absolutely uh, the right uh, position morally, and, and I hope uh, that the law will uh, eventually reflect that. Um, I'm ambivalent because uh, I think we've all acknowledged, and, and certainly the chairman uh, said very forcefully, that uh, this is not the ideal vehicle for this sort of uh, provision. Uh, this type of change in the law is, is more um, 
appropriately, more adequately addressed by the authorizing committee. Uh, we are faced, though, and a number of people have said this as well, we are faced with a situation where the authorizers have not acted. More broadly, the House has not acted. We've simply refused to address the mismatch between our immigration laws and the reality of 11 and a half million people, undocumented individuals, uh, currently in the United States. So I, uh, I support this amendment, but I would hope that in uh, <coughs> considering this today, we're in no way detracting, and I know this isn't Mr. Schiff's intention, no way detracting or denying the uh, priority of this as a policy matter before this House and before this country. We must have comprehensive immigration reform. We have, um, across the religious community, across the business community, uh, I've rarely seen this kind of head of steam build up behind needed legislation. I think in normal times we would have done it long ago, but uh, apparently the times aren't uh, normal. There are forces that are making this extremely difficult. Uh, I hope that uh, in adopting this amendment today we can uh, advance that cause because uh, this amendment uh, clearly is not uh, that this amendment is clearly not a, a, f a final resolution of this matter. Um, Ms. Captors uh, asked me to yield her a few seconds, and I'll be happy to do so. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ranking Member. I just wanted to say I've served in this committee a number of years. Regardless of which side of the aisle you sit on, I think this committee has distinguished itself in deliberating this amendment. I thank Mr. Schiff for offering it and for every single member who has spoken and those who are thoughtfully listening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Kingston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I rise in opposition of the amendment, but I, I really want to emphasize to the proponents of this the trouble that we get into when we are authorizing on an issue of this magnitude on an appropriation bill. For example, I want to uh, make sure that the majority understands that the premise of this is based on an executive order. It's not based on law that was passed by the U.S. Congress that went through hearings and committees and voted on in the House and the Senate. But if you read Section B, this is all based on an executive order. And we all know the pushback that we are getting on this administration's overuse of executive orders. So I want to point that out. And I want to show you a couple of things that, that really do not make any sense. Dr. Harris has pointed out that it says on line three, alien. It doesn't say illegal alien. So certainly it would include legal aliens. Um, also on line three, it talks about strong ties to the United States. What does that mean? Strong ties? And who would you depend on to make that interpretation? Then on line seven, if the alien poses a clear risk to national security, line eight, or is a serious violent, uh, has convicted of a serious violent felony. What is a clear risk to the national security or a serious violent felony as opposed to a non-serious violent felony um, or otherwise poses a clear danger to public safety? Would you not feel better if anybody who fell into those categories was automatically uh, arrested regardless of if they had a, a child or not? This is very, very vague language, and again, the whole premise of it is this Section B, which was a, an executive order. And then finally, remember, anything on appropriation bill is only good for one year. But there's no time limit on here, but because it would be on an appropriation bill, it would only be for one year, which to me, if you're going to have a major change in the law like this, you definitely would not do it on an appropriation bill. So. While I oppose the intent of this, I also want to say even the language itself is full of problems. And even if you supported this, based on this language, you would not want to vote on it if you were serious about it. You would have to go through the authorizing committee, and you would have to go beyond a presidential executive order. And I yield back. Let me say this. There's a reason why <clears throat> there's a reason why there's a rule in the House uh, disallowing appropriations bills to carry 
authorization language. There's a reason for that. And Chairman Kingston <clears throat> has touched upon it. Uh, the authorizers, uh, to my knowledge, have not had any hearings on this, nor obviously have we. Uh, there's all sorts of elements of the language before us, as Dr. Harris and Chairman Kingston have pointed out, that are ambiguous at best, <coughs> that need to be clarified before we walk off the deep end on something like this. Uh, this is this is a huge change in law. This is a major policy shift that needs to be done by the authorizing committee. We are not, we're not equipped uh, in our process to deal <coughs> with this broad a, a measure. <coughs> without hearings, <coughs> without expertise, and against the wishes of the people who are authorized to pass authorization, that's the authorizi authorizing committees. Look, my interest is, is passing a bill funding the Department of Homeland Security and the 22 agencies that rely upon its umbrella, Coast Guard, Secret Service, uh, and uh, any great variety of agencies. It's our job to provide the funding to keep the nation safe through the uh, Department of Homeland Security. I'm afraid if this became a part of the bill, we would never see the light of day. I think this bill would never make it to the floor. And uh, I don't want to see that happen to our committee. Uh, so uh, as, regardless of the merits of the gentleman's amendment, and there are many on either side, uh, regardless of the merits, my problem is I want to pass a bill, and this would prevent that. And number two, it's too big a change of law for us to, to bite into. So I would hope that we would, uh, would defeat the amendment. Mr. Fatah. Mr. Chairman, I think that it's clear that, uh, as you said, it's not an ideal vehicle for this. But I'm interested more in the American idea which is that we can have an opportunity. We can lose, but we can at least be on the record uh, of saying we don't think that children should be separated from their parents. <coughs> that in terms of uh, what we value as, uh, uh, as individuals and as a community and as a country, that we value family. And that um, I think that the SHIP Amendment gives us that opportunity to, to go on the record on this issue. Obviously, this is not going to become part of the, the, uh, the law. I think you're right that this is not the vehicle that we're going to get this done under. But we've never passed a DHS uh, immigration bill in this house. And moreover, we haven't passed any authorization bills for a long time. I mean, NASA, transportation. And we just did the word of bill, which gives us optimistic hope that maybe the House could function under regular order. But uh, I think it's a fool's errand to believe that we're going to do an immigration bill. So this may be the only opportunity for us, us to be heard and to be on the record about what we value as America as it relates to family being ripped apart. Uh, now, the, the amendment is clear on one point, and that is that if there's no threat to us as a nation, Children shouldn't be separated from their mother. I think that I'm happy that the gentleman has brought the amendment, even in this imperfect way. You know, our country's never been in a situation where we had perfect choices, but we've always moved towards becoming a more perfect union. So I thank the gentleman for making the amendment. I understand the chairman's uh, point of view, and I think he he's, uh, makes the point uh, excellently that this is not ideal. But I think the broader issue, the American ideal, is a much greater uh, uh, thing for us to uphold today by voting on behalf of this committee. Mrs. Hera Butler? I guess I, I, would, I would say, just really quickly, you know, the American ideals, the American dream, really part of what that embodies is fairness and justice. I mean, we're talking about families. 
we're talking about some families. But I don't know if, if anybody here has been to a citizenship ceremony. Um, they have families there who have been waiting and waiting and there to encourage their family members who have who've gotten in line and done it right, who have earned it. And this is a, I'm not saying this politically. I'm, I'm saying this as we need to consider fairness for all, of, all families, families who have immigrated here, who have paid the price, who have gotten in line, and who are watching us say, well, your family wasn't important enough to, to, to get rid of all the laws. We made you jump through the hoops, but this family is more important. We need, I'm saying this to say we need to move forward and do, I, I am all for, just like the good gentleman from Florida said, doing, reforming our very broken system. Let's, let's fix it. I'm there. I want to work with folks on, I don't care what party you're from, but my concern here is, is we're limiting justice and we're limiting fairness because there are a lot of Americans who've earned their citizenship. I can think of John Samarakis who runs a vacuum pump store in, in Vancouver, Clark County. He's passing his business on to the next generation. Um, or Tanya Jernigan from South Africa who's earned her citizenship and is a proud American. I, I can name off these immigrants in my district who have asked me to remain fair in this process. And, and let's fix it for those people who want to come here and be a part of the American dream. But I don't think that the way we fix it is by further breaking it. So with that, I, I reluctantly vote no, not on the, the idea here, but because I think we can and should do better. With that, I yield back. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, this morning, as, as I listen to this, I, I, I sense the emotion and, and the passion in this issue from both sides and, and uh, the gentleman from Florida as well. And, and, uh, and I respect the process uh, uh, that's been afforded to us in the House and, and, and the jurisdictions of the other committees uh, enough to know that this issue is, is far more important than to be offered on one page uh, of a piece of paper here this morning at the last minute without full deliberation or debate, quite frankly, with a lot of questions about technicalities and, and uh, what does this word mean and, and what's the impact of this phrase or that phrase, that for this committee with the importance that, that we hold as a committee to, to fund the federal government, that we would move so hastily um, to act on this one piece of paper to deal with an issue that is uh, of such uh, passion and importance to uh, not only members of the House but of our nation right now to, uh, to encourage the committee to just to pause for a second uh, to listen and, and heed the advice of Mr. Harris uh, from Maryland and Mr. Kingston from Georgia and others to just slow down and, 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 and tap the brakes here a second and, and really read the words carefully in this amendment and, and make sure that uh, uh, you make the right decision for our country and for this committee, quite frankly, and, and respect the process. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd have to oppose this. Mr. Schiff is recognized for a minute to close. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to thank you and the other members of the committee for the very respectful discussion we've had. I think if all debates on immigration reform could be uh, at this level, we would all be very well suited. Um, I want to talk for a minute about what this uh, amendment is and what it is not. Uh, first of all, this is not immigration reform. This amendment is not immigration reform. It changes no part of our immigration laws. I wish we could do that here, but we can't. So to the degree people say this is a uh, authorizing an appropriation, I don't agree. All we are saying is that we don't want funds used to deport the parents of American kids. Uh, it is a prioritization of the use of funds, which is what we do every day in this committee. If you look at the VA, for example, we have no hesitation in saying we are going to prioritize the use of funds in the VA to make sure we cut those wait lists, that we get veterans the treatment they need ASAP. And what's more, we don't want you using those funds to pay bonuses. So we don't have any problem with doing something like that in this committee. This is exactly that same kind of prioritization of the use of resources. It says, while we work towards comprehensive reform, let's not deport the parents of American kids. It says we're serious about comprehensive reform. We believe comprehensive reform is coming. So while it's coming, let's not deport these kids. Now, those of you that are making the argument that, well, let's wait for that reform, if we're really serious about it, if we really think that this reform is happening, if we knew, for example, that next month the bill is coming to the floor, I don't think there'd be any hesitation 
for us to say, let's not deport these yeah. parents because a month from now they're going to have relief. I think we could all come to agreement on that. I want to address a couple of the other points that, that have been made. Mr. diaz um you have worked on this issue for years. I have great respect for you and for what you've done. I know your heart is in exactly the right place. And that's true of many members that have worked on this issue. And if you were making this argument five years ago, don't do this because we're going to make this happen, it, res it would resonate. And others did make that argument. It did resonate. And when that argument was made three years ago, it resonated. Indeed, when this argument was made a year ago, it resonated. And six months ago, it resonated, although I have to say less. But now we are in June, with only a few months, really weeks left of the legislative calendar. Uh, and it's not much comfort to the kids who are worried about their parents being deported to say, well, let's not do this because it might impair our chances of passing a bill. The conventional wisdom after yesterday's election is that there isn't going to be immigration reform. I hope that conventional wisdom is wrong. I pray that that's wrong uh, for millions of families throughout the country. But I think one of the ways we can say that conventional wisdom is wrong is by coming together on a bipartisan basis and saying we are serious about immigration reform and we're going to show you we're serious because we know it's coming, we know we're going to do it, and we're not going to deport the parents of these kids while we're making this happen. And I think if we're not willing, Mr. Chairman, I have just one more minute. Uh, it's been a long debate, a lot of points, and I'm... Chairman's recognized. Thank you. And if we, can, if we can't, on a bipartisan basis, go to the floor of the House of Representatives and, saying, and say, we're not prepared to deport the parents of American kids while we work on this, if we can't even get the political support for that, what prayer do we have of passing something comprehensive that deals with, frankly, much more difficult questions? This is just one category of the humanitarian crisis that we're dealing with in immigration reform. But if even this, the, 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 the American kids and their parents, we can't confront, then we have no prayer of passing something comprehensive. Uh, you know, with respect to my colleague, uh, Dr. Harris, and the fact that there may be a, a handful of people with J visas who happen to have a child weather in the country, because of course all the other J visa cases this would have no impact on, to say that that should bar us, uh, from dealing with the millions of kids uh, who are here and at risk of losing their parents would truly be the tail wagging the dog. Uh, that cannot be a reason for inaction here. To say that, well, this would codify what the President's doing. No, this doesn't codify what the President is doing, Mr. Kingston. There's great respect, and I think you're terrific. Um, in fact, people criticize the President for uh, prioritizing deportation policy because he's not doing it uh, uh, they, they claim that he's overstepping the, his bounds and not acting with Congress on this. This is a chance for Congress to act and Congress to say, we're placing a priority here on our deportations and it doesn't include the parents of American kids. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, finally, I, I would just ask, let, let's, uh, let's make a, a brief statement here in this committee um, that uh, on sort of the point of the, the tip of the spear in terms of the humanita humanitarian crisis with the Im illegal immigration uh, and our failure to pass uh, a comprehensive bill, that uh, we're prepared to come together and show good faith and we're not going to deport the parents of these kids while we're working on something comprehensive. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The question is on the Schiff Amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. The no's seem to have it. The no's have it. A uh, request is made for a vote and sufficient support. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Adderholt? No. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Amaday? No. Mr. Amaday, no. Mr. Bishop? Yes. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Calvert? No. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter? No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cole? No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Crenshaw? No. Mr. Crenshaw, no. Mr. Cuellar? Yes. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson? No. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro? Mr. Dent? No. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Ballard. Mr. diaz Bullard, aye. Mr. Farr? Aye. Mr. Farr, aye. Mr. Fatah? Aye. Mr. Fatah, aye. Mr. Fleischman? No. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry? No. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelinghuysen? No. Mr. Freelinghuysen, no. Ms. Granger? No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves? No. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris? No. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Hera Butler? No. Ms. Hera Butler, no. Mr. Honda? Yes. Mr. Honda, aye. Mr. Joyce? No. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor? Aye. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kingston? No. Mr. Kingston, no. Mr. Latham? No. Mr. Latham, no. Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy? Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum? Aye. 
Ms. McCollum, aye. Mr. Moran? Aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Nunnally? Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Owens, aye. Mr. Pastor? Aye. Mr. Pastor, aye. Ms. Pingree? Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Price? Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley? Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby? Aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers? No. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney? No. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Roby Allard? Aye. Ms. Roby Allard, aye. Mr. Ryan? Mr. Schiff? Aye. Mr. Schiff, aye. Mr. Serrano? Aye. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson? No. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart? No. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Valadeo? Aye. Mr. Valadeo, aye. Mr. Viskoski? Aye. Mr. Viskoski, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz? Aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Wolf? No. Mr. Wolf, no. Mr. Womack? No. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder? No. Mr. Yoder, no. Any member wish to be recorded? Ms. DeLauro? The lady is not recorded. Aye. Mr. Laurel, aye. Are there members who wish to change their vote? Clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 23, the nays are 26, and the amendment is not agreed to. Are there additional amendments? Mr. Quigley. I have an amendment at the desk. If we could dispense with the reading, Mr. Chairman. Which amendment is it, sir? Amendment number one. Amendment offered by Mr. Quigley. Page 11, strike the proviso beginning on line 21. The reading. Without objection, the uh, reading is dispensed with. Chairman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, when I describe this committee's work to my constituents, I like to refer to what we are doing as making smart investments. We have limited, lately very limited, money to invest, and this committee makes tough choices of what programs offer the American taxpayer the best return on their investment. With that in mind, I'm offering an amendment with Congressman Serrano and Congressman Honda to end what I believe is an outdated idea that we have supported for too long at too high a price, the detention bed mandate. I intend to offer and withdraw this amendment because I can count votes, and I know that we still have some work to do on this issue. But given the high cost of maintaining an arbitrary 34,000 detention beds, especially when in many cases there are more humane, more cost-effective, secure alternatives available, I think this is a worthy conversation to have here. Now, I appreciate that we have made some significant progress on this issue. I'm glad that Chairman Carter, Secretary Johnson, and I agree that this mandate is a, a requirement to maintain these beds, not a mandate to fill these beds. It's also promising that we have begun to more appropriately fund alternatives to detentions in this bill. It is clear from the growing number of immigrants that we are detained each year that DHS still relies on this language when making many custody decisions. Custody decisions should be made on an individual basis following a calculus of flight risk, risk to public safety, and other relevant humanitarian considerations. They shouldn't be based on this committee's report language. Even though having these beds doesn't mean we have to fill them, it does mean we have to pay for them. Instead of spending an average of $164 per day on detention, we should be utilizing more humane, cost-effective, and secure alternatives to detention for as little as $0.30 cents to $14 per day. We need to get rid of the detention bed mandate so we can give more flexibility to the use of detention funds for alternatives to detention. Allowing increased flexibility in making custody decisions would allow DHS to better use its resources result in less unnecessary separation of families and provide cost saving to the American taxpayer. Mr. Chairman, this isn't a partisan issue. An amendment to strike the detention ma bed mandate offered on the floor last year was supported by a significant number of members of this committee from both sides of the aisle. We need to spend smarter when it comes to immigrant detention and eliminate the detention bed mandate. And this is an important first step.
Did the gentleman say he wishes to withdraw this? Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, I would like the, my colleagues who are with me on this to be able to speak on the matter before we withdraw, just to give them this few minutes. Thank withdraw. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of this amendment and thank Mr. Quigley, Mr. Honda for working with me on this. The detention bed mandate is one of the most onerous and wasteful provisions in this bill. With spending money maintaining and filling space in immigration detention centers that the Department of Homeland Security has said they don't need and that the numbers don't back up. The goal of the DHS detention system is to ensure immigration court appearances for immigrants who are threats to public safety, who are a significant flight risk. The vast majority of immigrants do not fall into this category. The fact is that the vast majority of undocumented immigrants, if asked to appear before an immigration court, will do so, no questions asked. There are many cheaper, more economical forms of monitoring for these individuals. But in too many cases, we're simply wasting money on more expensive, unnecessary detentions. According to this bill, we have had to increase the custody operations account information points on quickly Serrano Honda detention bill mandate by 171 million uh, to accommodate the detention bed mandate. It is far smarter and more physically, fiscally responsible to determine the number of detention spaces necessary. In short, this bill is unnecessary. The gentleman is going to withdraw it, but uh, I really feel that this is one area where even the Department of Homeland Security has told us that they don't need uh, this money, that they don't need to be doing this, and yet we insist on doing it. So I would hope that as we move forward into conference, we could just get rid of this provision and do the right thing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I rise in support of the gentleman's uh, amendment, which would strike the requirement of the bill that ICE maintains uh, 34,000 detention beds each day. To meet this quota, ICE is forced to find immigrants to detain immigrants who could otherwise be released. It must continue operating facilities with track records of abuse that should be closed. Detention is the most expensive way of, for dealing with a problem. It costs taxpayers nearly $160 per day per detained immigrant. In fiscal year 2014, this will total about $2 billion, and by contrast, release under supervision or placement of alternatives to detention, such as bond or parole, costs less than $17 per day per person. The quota keeps ICE from using less costly alternatives to detention and forces ICE to continue operating facilities to maintain an arbitrary number of beds. No other law enforcement agency is forced to operate on our quota system, yet we require ICE to do so, tearing apart families and communities in the process and wasting taxpayer money. We must end this practice. That is why I support the gentleman's amendment. Well, thank you, and I appreciate this amendment coming up. I do support this amendment, and I appreciate the conversation being started. Um, we have to think outside the box, and this is an opportunity to think outside the box where we can come up with more affordable ways of housing these people. Uh, the mandate is not the right way to, pol uh, to have policy in place, and uh, this is an opportunity for us to have this conversation. So thank you for bringing it up, and uh, look forward to working with you on the future on this. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I appreciate my colleagues' thoughtful remarks on this matter. Uh, just a quick parallel. There's not a county jail in this country, in my understanding, that doesn't have alternatives to detention, largely based on the st still keeping this public safe, but dealing with the reality of being cost effective. So uh, just understand there's a, there's a reasonable alternative to do what you want to do. And uh, I, I'm hoping that in conference we move forward on this, and I appreciate your time and consideration. Mr. Chairman, and I withdraw the amendment at this time. Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Moran. I ask unanimous Mr. consent. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized for five quick minutes. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Section 531 of this bill would specifically restrict DHS 
from transferring any Guantanamo detainees to the United States. Obviously, this is authorizing policy on an appropriations bill. Uh, and the net effect of this no transfer provision is that the remaining 149 detainees will stay at Guantanamo indefinitely, never charged with a crime, never brought to justice, never cleared for release. My amendment would allow the U.S. military to transfer to their home countries the 72 detainees who have been cleared for release by the intelligence community and the Defense Joint Chiefs of Staff, and to bring those not cleared for release to the U.S. to be charged, tried, and sentenced. Now, the Sergeant Bergdahl Prisoner Exchange has brought this issue once again to central stage. The fact is that if we had dealt with these individuals in what I would consider to be a responsible and more legal way, we wouldn't be in this situation discussing the merits of the decision to release five of them. But for 12 years now, Guantanamo has operated outside the legal checks of the American judicial system, serving as a physical reminder of the widening gap between the principles that define us as Americans and our willingness to abandon those principles in the name of national security. It also continues to serve as a recruiting tool for terrorists around the world who want to use the alleged abuses and injustices committed at Guantanamo, some true, some not true, but to fuel hatred for America and its allies by our enemies. Mr. Chairman, with the final withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan this year, the continued indefinite detention at Guantanamo enters a new stage. We will no longer be at war, and the current authorization for the use of military force will expire. So now is the time to ask the question, do we have the legal authority to hold these enemy combatants indefinitely? We will soon be faced with the prospect of having to release them without any further opportunity to charge or to try them, or alternatively, to continue their detention without any authority to do so. Now is the time to either transfer or bring these men to trial. Now, while we can still, still do so on our own terms, while we can give the DOD the uh, legal authority it needs to make the right decisions about these prisoners. Now, there are 149 detainees left at Gitmo. Some are prisoners of war. Some uh, are uh, uh, the worst of the worst, about 15 of them. But among them are a substantial number of Muslims who are innocent of any act against this country or our allies, who are in the wrong place at the wrong time and basically kidnapped by bounty hunters. It's costing us $1.7 million per detainee per year versus 34,000 at a maximum security prison in the United States. Now, Mr. Chairman, military commissions at Guantanamo are not working. In fact, the only two guilty verdicts these commissions issued were both overturned. In the words of the family members of the 9-11 victims, the current system is, and I quote, immoral, unlawful, expensive, counterproductive, unnecessary, and has failed to deliver justice for the 9-11 attacks. The fact is that in trying the bad guys at Guantanamo, uh, like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, by military commissions, we treat them like warriors rather than the criminals that they are. General Michael, Michael Lennett, who oversaw the opening of Guantanamo, has said that its continued operation <coughs> has helped our enemies and makes a mockery of our values. So, Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, I encourage you to support this amendment in order to put an end to the hunger strike, to release the innocent, to prosecute those who have legitimately done us harm, it's the right thing to do, morally, ethically, and legally, and the time to do it is now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Chairman Carter. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. We've debated amendments like this many times before. Uh, we've heard arguments from the gentleman, and, and they've always been the same. It's been an argument we've eject, rejected time and time again. The simple fact of the matter is there are hardened terrorists at Gitmo, and we don't want them on the U.S. soil. It's entirely inappropriate to use scarce DHS funds for any such transfer. That's why Chairman Rogers inserted this limitation years ago when he was subcommittee ranking member. In fact, we just had an extensive debate about Gitmo detainee transfers and notifications yesterday during the defense markup, and this committee voiced its collective position very clearly. I strongly oppose the gentleman's amendment. I urge my colleagues, colleagues to do so also. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, I rise in uh, strong support of the uh, gentleman's uh, amendment, and it uh, seems odd to say the burden of proof should lay on him. The burden of proof should lay on including this kind of uh, extraneous amendment on this bill in the first place. Uh, he seeks to strike an amendment that simply shouldn't be there. It doesn't belong in the Homeland Security <coughs> Appropriations Bill. It has no jurisdiction over the Justice Department or the Department of Defense matters. It's a political gesture, and yes, it has gone on for years. This would be a very good time to stop it. The majority's inserted this extraneous language across many, many appropriations bills, and they've done it for a long time. The people who insist on these provisions year after year, they don't seem to be fully aware of the stain on our country that indefinite detention uh, provides. They don't seem to fully appreciate that Guantanamo is used as a regular propaganda tool for Al-Qaeda and its affiliated groups. They seem to think that military commissions are the only possible form of justice. The reality, of course, is quite uh, to the contrary. Military commissions uh, don't work. They have a, a spotty record at best. A couple of convictions, I believe, both overturned. Criminal courts, on the other hand, have a proven track record and a high success rate. More than 400 terrorists uh, successfully prosecuted. Anyone who doesn't believe we can appropriately try and convict and incarcerate the most dangerous people in the world is simply not paying attention. It's a very strange uh, assertion to make about our criminal justice and, and penal systems. In fact, proponents of indefinite detention at Guantanamo Bay are, are effectively denigrating those systems, <coughs> exalting these detainees to some kind of mythical status. We, we simply can't deal with them through our normal high-security prisons. Uh, why would we want to do that in the eyes of the world? Denigrate our criminal justice and penal systems, exalt these uh, detainees. So let's end this political gamesmanship. It's absurd to include this in appropriations bills. We need to do what's right and adopt the Moran Amendment. Mr. Moran is recognized for a minute to close. Mr. Chairman, uh, if I'm remembered for anything, it may be uh, tenacity and consistency. Uh, but. Uh, the, the fact is, uh, as Mr. Price so articulately put, uh, I don't think this is helping our national security. Uh, it's certainly not helping our budget, $2.7 million a year uh, versus 34000 And what just happened with the Bergdahl Exchange shows we should have dealt with this before now. And when the authorization for the use of military force expires, we have no authority to retain these people. They were supposedly enemy combatants. Well, you got to release them when the combat is over. Uh, now is the time to deal with this. Now is the time uh, to punish uh, the people who ought to be tried, charged, convicted, as we have with 300 terrorist, uh, 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 terrorists in the United States. What we're doing at Guantanamo doesn't work. Both cases were overturned. That we, where we thought we could get a conviction. Punish the, punish the guilty, release the innocent, and let's get ourselves back onto the moral high ground. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question is on the Moran Amendment. All in favor, say aye. Aye. aye.
All opposed will say no. No. The no's have it, and the amendment is not yes, agreed to. Roll call, Mr. Chairman. Roll call is requested, and, and a sufficient show of support. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt. No. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Amaday. No. Mr. Amaday, no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Calvert. No. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Crenshaw. No. Mr. Crenshaw, no. Mr. Coyar. No. Mr. Coyar, no. Mr. Culberson. No. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. Deloro. No. Mr. Dent. No. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. Diaz Ballard. No. Mr. Diaz Ballard, no. Mr. Farr. Mr. Farr, aye. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fleischman? No. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry? No. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelingheisen? No. Mr. Freelingheisen, no. Ms. Granger? No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves? No. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris? Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler? No. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Honda? Aye. Mr. Honda, aye. Mr. Joyce? No. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Ms. Kaptur? Aye. Ms. Kaptur, aye. Mr. Kingston? No. Mr. Kingston, no. Mr. Latham. <coughs> Ms. Lee. Aye. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy? Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum? Aye. Ms. McCollum, aye. Mr. Moran? Aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Nunnally? Mr. Owens? No. Mr. Owens, no. Mr. Pastor? Aye. Mr. Pastor, aye. Ms. Pingree? Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Price? Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley? Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby? Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers? No. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney? No. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Roby Allard? Aye. Ms. Roby Allard, aye. Mr. Ryan? Mr. Schiff? Aye. Mr. Schiff, aye. Mr. Serrano? Aye. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson? Mr. Stewart? No. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Valadeo? No. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Viskoski? Aye. Mr. Viskoski, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz? Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Wolf? No. Mr. Wolf, no. Mr. Womack? Mr. Yoder? No. Mr. Yoder, no. Are there members who wish to be recorded? Mr. Bishop? I'm not the gentleman is not recorded. <laughs> Mr. Laura? Mr. Bishop, aye. I'm not gentleman lady is not recorded. Mr. Laura, aye. Are there members who wish to be recorded or change the vote? Clerk will call or will tally. While the clerk is tallying, uh, we will be having votes on the floor around 1.30, we're told. Uh, so uh, we need to expedite our. our Gentlemen's way. not recorded. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Latham. Gentleman is not recorded. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Latham, no. Not recorded. <laughs> Mr. Simpson, no. So, with votes impending at 1.30, we need to finish this bill, plus adjust the 302Bs, which won't take too long. Nevertheless, uh, time is of the essence. On this vote, the uh, yeas are 18, the nays are 30. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Adderall. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Adderholt at the appropriate place in the bill. I insert the following. None of the funds appropriated by this act for U.S. immigration. Has the uh, reading be with Without you. objection, the reading is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, simply have a, uh, a, an amendment here this uh, morning, or maybe I should say this afternoon, uh, that uh, is actually was offered by Chairman Carter uh, last year. I, think, I want to thank him for his ongoing support for it. Uh, this is an issue that I think needs to be codified that I've brought up before. Uh, let me just say our colleague, Alan Nunley, uh, was originally going to bring this up, but as many of you know, he is undergoing... Uh, surgery this week uh, out in Houston, and uh, he is in our thoughts and prayers. But uh, the language simply says that none of the funds that are appropriated uh, by, the, uh, by this act for the uh, ICE shall be available to pay for abortion except where the life of the mother would be endangered. 
if the fetus will carry the term or in the cape of rape or incest. Uh, this is not new language. Uh, it's not a new standard. It's been carried in the CGS bill for 20 years. It cons it's consistent with the current law uh, as uh, the Hyde language, and it is a standard that ICE already adheres to by way of regulation. Uh, it simply codifies, as I mentioned, what ICE already has been following. It includes the uh, Moran second degree, second degree Amendment that we discussed two years ago in our debate on this. Uh, the amendment uh, is uh, confined to ICE. It mirrors the structure and substance of what has been carried, uh, as I say, in the CJS bill for over 20 years. So uh, that's all this bill does. We uh, ask for the support for it, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. Ms. Loy. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to this amendment. We saw a similar amendment last year by our friends on the other side of the aisle to mobilize their base rather than focus on this bill's purpose, homeland security. The issue at hand, of course, is crucial funding for our nation's homeland security needs, including federal law enforcement, cyber and border security, and disaster preparation. When I visited families and businesses whose property was destroyed after Superstorm Sandy, nearly all asked for federal assistance to help get them back on their feet. My friends, not one said their priority was limiting women's reproductive health choices. Not one. On this subcommittee and the Homeland Security Authorizing Committee, I've met with first responders, ICE agents, Border Patrol, many other security personnel. Not once have they said that women's reproductive health makes their job more difficult. Not once. Our focus today should be to equip federal law enforcement with the tools to keep us safe. Weighing down this bill with ideological riders is a disservice to all first responders and our constituents who help us to provide for the needs of our first responders and safety of our communities, prevent terrorism, secure our borders. Let's end these games once and for all I ask that my colleagues oppose this amendment. Ms. Roby. We're debating right now a long settled issue, uh, Mr. Chairman, of whether or not taxpayers should fund the, innocent, the taking of innocent human life. This language uh, offered by the gentleman from Alabama, like the Hyde Amendment, ensures that Americans are not forced to pay for abortions. Um, polling consistently shows that uh, over 60% of Americans oppose taxpayer funding for abortions. This amendment, as was stated by the chairman, uh, codifies the current administration's practice um, as described in their statements of administration policy in 2012 and 2013. Uh, this amendment mirrors the longstanding CJS policy prohibiting federal funds for paying for um, prisoner abortions, which was just included in the Senate's own CJS appropriations bill last week. And I just want to say, abortion is not women's health. There's a reason why people don't call abortion what it is anymore, which is abortion, and because it's brutal and it's cruel, not just to the life, but also to the mother. Um, we should not, under any circumstances, force Americans, taxpayers, to fund abortions. And so I support the gentleman's amendment, and I yield back. Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, once again, I rise in opposition to this unnecessary uh, amendment. The fact that uh, this uh, prohibition is already in law, strange that it should be argued that that's a reason to, uh, to uh, include this amendment, because uh, actually it's a reason that this amendment is not needed. Forty-one years ago, the Supreme Court ruled um, that the U.S. Constitution protects a, a woman's right to choose. That decision's been the law of the land ever since. It's been under constant attack since the day it was rendered. These attacks have become uh, continuously more strident, with attacks on women's reproductive freedom now extending even to contraception. Numerous restrictions in law already condition, already qualify reproductive choice in practice. Among these is the government-wide prohibition on the use of federal funds for abortion procedures outlined in the President's Executive Order 13535 issued on March 24th of 2010. 
<coughs> and the requirements of this executive order are specifically formalized in Part 4.4 of ICE's detention standards. Now, I believe, and, and many others believe, that these restrictions are excessive. But they are settled. They are a settled matter. So why? What's the point of raising the issue again on the Homeland Security funding bill? It's simply picking a political fight, picking an unnecessary political fight, as if we didn't already have enough controversies to deal with. Before a similar amendment was offered two years ago, uh, somebody got the bright idea of putting it on this bill. This bill had never touched on the topic of abortion because it's not relevant to the Department of Homeland Security. It falls far outside the lines of jurisdiction of this committee. So I urge my colleagues to oppose this cynical and unnecessary amendment. Mr. Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a parliamentary inquiry. In light of the uh, Adam Schiff Amendment discussion, is this an example of how we waive uh, an exception to legislating on appropriations bill, or is this an example of how we legislate on appropriations bills? <laughs> oh, that's great. This is how we appropriate. Wait. Who seeks recognition? Uh, Judge Carter. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of this amendment. In a nutshell, as has been stated, this amendment does nothing more than codify ICE policy, a policy ICE has followed since its creation, and that its predecessor, INS, and Immigration and Naturalization Service, followed for years. Respectfully, I ask for the adoption of this amendment. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the time, and I will yield back. Ms. Washman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in uh, opposition to the amendment uh, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that this Amendment represents uh, a painful symbol of the disregard that anti-choice politicians express for the plight of the roughly 3,000 women held in immigration detention on any given day. Proposals like this are simply an attempt to ensnare an unrelated bipartisan bill in anti-choice politics and permanently deny care to women who are already facing overwhelming circumstances. We know all too, all too well that opponents of women's reproductive health in Congress put politics before women's health. But injecting politics into a debate on national and homeland security should not be tolerated. The Adderholt Amendment, and I have a tremendous respect for Mr. Adderholt, but it disallows access to the full legal range of reproductive health care for women, including access to abortion services. That's already law. The mis this misguided amendment would allow non-medical personnel, such as a detention center employee with no medical training, to block a woman's ability to access the information and care that she needs. This amendment is unnecessary and redundant. Current ICE detention standards on medical care for women already deny women access to abortion in case of, in cases, except in cases of rape, incest, or life endangerment. The bottom line is that a woman, not politicians, should make the informed decisions when it comes to her pregnancy. Opponents of women's health care continue to abuse the appropriations process to undermine women's access to comprehensive reproductive care, including access to safe and legal abortion. The Outer Holt Amendment is just another political attack on women's health, including allowing non-medical personnel to withhold information and medically appropriate care from women, and it should be defeated. The amendment is about more than just restricting government funding for abortion. The amendment prevents immigrant women who often already face terrible circumstances in federal immigration custody from making extremely personal medical decisions and hands that decision over to politicians. And finally, and most importantly, ICE funds do not pay for abortions. It's another example of legislators playing politics with women's health, according to the ICE spokesperson. Since the agency was created in 2003, it has never paid for an abortion. This amendment is unnecessary because the Hyde Amendment already covers this, and we are injecting the, the politics of women's health into a bill that should be a, devoid of politics. I yield back. Ms. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in, in total opposition, opposition to this amendment, uh, and it is based on ideology. For the life of me, it, it, it's really mind-boggling that we're having a debate about a woman's right to choose, about abortion, about women's health on a homeland security bill. Earlier and yesterday, you've talked about amendments that were not germane uh, for this committee. 
This, this amendment clearly is legislating on an appropriations bill. I, again, I have to just say this war on women is all too familiar. It's not news that opponents of women's health care, women's reproductive rights, uh, put politics before women's health. This is another example of this, inserting this totally irresponsible amendment and this debate on a homeland security bill <clears throat> is really quite outrageous. The right to privacy in our country, the right for a woman to make personal medical decisions should be that woman's right. It should not be our decisions in a homeland security, on a homeland security bill in an appropriations committee to legislate a woman's decision or what a woman should or should not do in dire circumstances when she's in a very vulnerable state. And so I ask that we stop playing games with women, stop trying to legislate on these appropriations bills. This clearly is probably the most glaring example uh, that we've had again. And uh, I ask that we uh, defeat this amendment. Mr. Adderholtz, recognized for a minute to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, I want to stress we're, we're talking about federal funding of abortion. We're not talking about outlawing abortion in the entire United States of America with this. Um, the reason it's on this Homeland Security Bill is because we're talking about ICE, and that's where the funding occurs. Uh, it, it's very disconcerting and really, quite honestly, breaks my heart when I hear people get up and say this is a, a political issue. Uh, I. Uh, because if you know me very well, and those who have said that, evidently they don't know me very well, this is not a political issue with me. And, um, and if uh, I would, I, it, I mean, it just shows that you don't really have never really sit down and talked with me before. So um, I uh, stress to you this is just codifies what is already in the law. And uh, if, if you disagree with, you know, the federal funding, I understand that. But it, like I said, it's very disconcerting when... Uh, you say that it's political. I understand people disagree on this issue, and that's fine. And I, you ha need to vote against it. But uh, again, this is something that we're just codifying what's in the law, and I would ask support for the amendment. Question is on the Adderholt Amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. The no amendment problem. is agreed to. Are there uh, show of hands? Sufficient number to clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderhold, aye. Mr. Amaday. Yes. Mr. Amaday, aye. Mr. Bishop? No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Calvert? Aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter? Aye. Mr. Car Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Crenshaw? Aye. Mr. Crenshaw, aye. Mr. Cuellar? Aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson? Aye. Mr. Culberson, aye. Ms. Deloro? No. Ms. Deloro, no. Mr. Dent? Aye. Mr. Dent, aye. Mr. diaz Ballard. Mr. diaz Blart. Mr. diaz Blart, aye. Mr. Farr? Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fleischman? Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Mr. Feelingheisen? Mr. Feelingheisen, aye. Ms. Granger? Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Graves? Mr. Graves? Mr. Graves, aye. Dr. Harris? Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Vera Butler? Ms. Herrera Butler, aye. Mr. Honda? No. Mr. Honda, no. Mr. Joyce? Mr. Joyce, aye. Ms. Kaptur? No. Ms. Kaptur, no. Mr. Kingston? Aye. Mr. Kingston, aye. Mr. Latham? Aye. Mr. Latham, aye. Ms. Lee? No. Ms. Lee, no. Mrs. Lowy? No. Mrs. Lowy, no. Ms. McCollum? No. Mrs. Ms. McCollum, no. Mr. Moran? No. Mr. Moran, no. Mr. Nunnally? Mr. Owens? No. Mr. Owens, no. Mr. Pastor? No. Mr. Pastor, no. Ms. Pingree? No. Ms. Pingree, no. Mr. Price? No. Mr. Price, no. Mr. Quigley? No. Mr. Quigley, no. Mrs. Roby? Aye. Mrs. Roby, aye. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Mr. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mr. Rooney? Aye. Mr. Rooney, aye. Ms. Robo Allard? No. Mr. Robo Allard, no. Mr. Ryan? Mr. Schiff? No. Mr. Schiff, no. Mr. Serrano? No. Mr. Serrano, no. Mr. Simpson? Aye. Mr. Simpson, aye. Mr. Stewart? Yes. Mr. Stewart, aye. Mr. Valadeo? Aye. Mr. Valadeo, aye. Mr. Visklowski? No. Mr. Visklowski, no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz? No. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, no. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Mr. Wolf, aye. Mr. Womack. Aye. Mr. Womack, aye. Mr. Yoder. Aye. Mr. Yoder, aye. Are there members who wish to be recorded or change their vote? 
Clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 29, the nays are 18. The amendment is agreed to. Ms. Robel Allard. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, last year, Transportation does the Security Officer. Have, does the gentlelady have an amendment? Oh, I'm sorry. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will I read. Ask unanimous the amendment offered by Ms. Robel Allard. The reading is dispensed with. Gentlelady is recognized. Um, last year, a Transportation Security Officer, her order Hernandez was murdered in a tragic shooting at LAX airport. He was the first TSO in the history of the Transportation Security Administration to be killed in the line of duty. Mr. Hernandez was a living husband and father who left behind two young children. He planned to celebrate his 40th birthday just days after he was gunned down while on duty. His killing has caused serious financial hardships for his young family. My amendment will provide Mr. Hernandez's family, uh, wife, and children with the death benefits provided under current law to families of other federal officers killed in the line of duty. This amendment will help Mr. Hernandez's young family to make ends meet, and it will send a powerful message to the men and women of DHS that we value their service and honor their sacrifice. And I hope uh, you will all join me in supporting this very important amendment. Judge Carter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I rise to support this amendment. In fact, this accomplishes something similar to what we tried to do at the conference last year. A public safety officer benefit program was designed for men and women who serve their community in potentially dangerous circumstances. TSA screening personnel are not covered by the program. This corrects an error, and I support this and urge a yes vote. Mr. Price. Yes, we're in agreement. Uh, all in favor of the amendment will say aye. 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 Opposed will say no. Ayes have it. The gentlelady's amendment is approved. <laughs> Mr. Quigley. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. It asks the dispense of the reading. Amendment offered by Mr. Quigley. The reading is dispensed with. Mr. Chairman, the government has a moral responsibility to ensure the safety of any person under its charge. Any person. That's why Congress in 2003 took an important step to prevent sexual abuse in Americans' prisons and jails when it unanimously passed the Prison Rape Elimination Act. PREA set a zero tolerance standard for prison rape and sexual abuse and created guidelines to hold correctional facilities across the country accountable for protecting their inmates. And while these across the board standards have resulted in significant progress in the fight against rape and sexual abuse in our prison system, Unfortunately, these guidelines have yet to be fully implemented in our immigration detention system. For too long, we have allowed the pervasive and systematic abuse of detainees held in our immigration detention facilities. This is especially true with regard to the LGBT community. A GAO report that I requested last year identified significant problems at detention facilities across the country and questioned the adequacy of investigations into allegations of sexual <laughs> assault and abuse. That report outlined the need for a single uniform standard to be adopted by ICE to protect all immigration detainees across the country from falling victim to sexual assault and abuse. This year we made an important step in the fight for detainee protections when a final rule was issued by pr for PREA implementation in immigrant detention. My amendment would help us take the next step providing more appropriate funding for the implementation of these vital standards. I was glad to see the $1.4 million set aside by the committee in this year's report for PREA. But if we want to be serious about implementation, if we want to get the job done, it's clear that this number is simply not enough. We know that the final PREA rule, that implementation cost more. The cost for the offset for my amendment is also important. It comes from the additional $15 million included in the bill to combat the apparent public safety concerns of the increasing number of local law enforcement agencies which refuse to comply with ICE detainers. Chicago is one of those local agencies and the committee listed it among localities in this year's report that are contributing to a decrease in safety. 
Mr. Chairman, I want to set the record straight. Chicago's decision to only honor de de ICE detainers in criminal cases does not make any community less safe. It actually does just the opposite. We know that local law enforcement's participation in immigration enforcement destroys trust with the immigrant community, making our communities less safe by discouraging immigrants to report criminal activity or cooperate in criminal investigations. That's why so many law enforce, local law enforcement leaders have come out against this policy. Our federal courts have also consistently held that our detainer practices fail to meet constitutional standards. Mr. Chairman, the committee needs to invest in public safety. Supporting unconstitutional ICE detainers is not the way to do it. PREA implementation is. Judge Carter. Uh, I think the gentleman is aware that we have covered this subject effectively in this bill. It's my understanding the gentleman intends to withdraw. Uh, if that is the case, then we're moving on a time schedule. And uh, I think we've covered what you have asked for in this bill. Mr. Price. Well, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank the gentleman from Illinois for raising this issue. I fully agree. We must ensure that ICE has the uh, resources it needs to fully implement the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards at detention facilities. Uh, the bill does provide the requested funding level for these efforts, but I'll be happy to continue to work with the gentleman and, and with the chairman as we uh, go through this process to make sure to reassess whether the resources provided will address the agency's needs. And I thank the gentleman. Mr. Quigley to close. Mr. Chairman, uh, the conversations earlier with staff, it was my understanding that while the committee is not in support of my pay for, they are willing to work with us on this issue as time goes on. Is that correct? If that I'm is correct. It, if that's the case, Mr. Chairman, I do appreciate their cooperation. This is an important issue. And at this point, given that agreement to cooperate, we will withdraw the amendment. Amendment is withdrawn. Are there any other amendments? Mr. Uh, Chairman Wolf uh, is recognized for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to favorably report the Homeland Security Appropriation Bill for fiscal year 2015 to the House. Question is on the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The amendment, uh, the motion is agreed to. Three days. Uh, three days is uh, granted. Our uh, last order of business today is to revise the uh, committee's 302Bs. We need to take this action today because uh, uh, we need to reflect the additional disaster cap adjustment that was included in the Homeland Security Bill. Uh, and in addition, we're making several reallocations among subcommittees to reflect CBO scoring of bills as they move through the committee process as well as the CGS bill that uh, has passed the House. These uh, reallocations simply move resources from those subcommittees who came in under their current allocation to those subcommittees that can use them, in particular financial services and labor HHS received small increases in BA. And thirdly, the revised allocations also anticipate the additional <coughs> outlays which the Budget Committee intends to provide us. As we continue to develop our remaining appropriations bills, we're looking with the, working with the Budget Committee to ensure that we have the outlay resources we need so additional 302B adjustments may be needed down the road. We need to approve these revised allocations in order to continue being able to bring our bills to the floor within the overall spending level set by the bipartisan Ryan Murray deal. So I ask for your support and recognize Mrs. Lowy for any comments. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the 302B adjustments. The House passed budget resolution shortchanged the committee's allocation of outlays by more than $1 billion. This adjustment restores those outlays and distributes them among the subcommittees. The revised allocation also provides the cap adjustment to reflect FEMA disaster relief funding. Finally, the adjustment reallocates $18 million in non-defense discretionary BA from CJS and defense to labor HHS and financial services. Thank Is there further discussion? Are there amendments? 
If not, uh, I recognize Mr. Wolf for a motion. Well, Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee approve the revised report on the 302B allocation for fiscal year 2015. You've heard the motion. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed will say no. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be given the authority to make technical and conforming change to the items approved today. With that objection, it's so ordered. There being no further business, the committee stands adjourned. What? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good work. Good luck. Good, good work. Thank you. Good work, everybody. Good work. longer. She's not going to get through undergraduate in four years. It's going to take her five, six, maybe more years to get through. And whether she'll ever become that pediatric dentist that she wants to be, I don't know. That's what's happening in America today. And millions of others could tell you similar stories of career decisions that they've made, giving up the investment that would be the most important investment in their life 
uh, because of the financial considerations. So we have a bill before us, the bill that we have on the floor right now that could do something about it. Now, I'd be the first to acknowledge there's a lot we could do to help in this regard. But I want to thank Senator Warren for her leadership in bringing forward a bill that would make a difference for millions of students that hold debt today. It will make a difference. It will make it less costly for them to take out the loans that they have taken out. It would affect, uh, I said, millions of students. And let me just give you one number which I find somewhat uh, shocking. And that is, I think Americans would be upset, disappointed, and outraged to learn that their government is making money off of student loans. Let me repeat that again. The federal government is making money off of student loans. You see, the interest rates are higher than what the cost of the student loan is. Taking into consideration defaults, taking into consideration administrative costs, taking into consideration the cost of borrowing, between 2007 and 2012, $66 billion was made off the backs of students who can't afford the loans they currently have. Well, what Senator Warren's bill does is allow us, allow students, allow those who hold student debt to refinance taking advantage of the lower interest rates. It's not going to be subsidized loans. There will be no cost to the taxpayers to do this. This seems like a no-brainer, quite frankly. Make it easier for them. Let the, we, we let homeowners refinance their mortgages, and we've passed special legislation to allow that. We allow businesses to refinance their loans to the lowest competitive rate. Why can't students do this? That's what the, the bill before us does. It lets us move forward at no cost because it is not, we're not subsidizing the loans, and just because of our unusual scoring reasons here, she provides an offset, which quite frankly I don't think is necessary, but I certainly support the bill, and the offset is certainly one that has millionaires paying their fair share and makes sense. So what will this do? We'll save thousands of dollars for those who currently hold uh, loans. That's an important thing to do. And I know some are saying, well, don't we need more accountability from higher education? Yes, we do. Don't we need more transparency in higher education? Yes, we do. Don't we need uh, to have uh, better consumer information in higher education? Yes, I agree with all of the above. But today we can do something about the interest costs and correct, I think, an injustice of government making money off of student loans and do this in a way that make it more affordable for families. We can do something that can truly help. It will provide help to families. President Obama has acted. I thank him for doing that. Five million families will benefit from his executive order or clarification that says no more than 10 percent of your income needs to be paid, pay, done in order to repay student loans and, and capping the number of years. That's going to help. Uh, he's also doing more to promote awareness of repayment options. That is good. But we in Congress have an opportunity to act and we can act today. Uh, I hope that we would get bipartisan support to help middle-income families uh, and to help our country. And I would urge my colleagues to allow us to get on this bill, pass it, and help uh, uh, the middle class of America. With that, uh, Madam uh, President, I would uh, suggest the absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Madam President? The Senator from Florida. Are we in a quorum call? Yes. Madam President, I ask that the unanimous consent of the quorum call be uh, done away with. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. And I know that in a few moments here, I'm going to yield the floor, hopefully, to my colleagues uh, who will have an announcement about uh, the progress that's been made on the Veterans Bill, an important issue. I wanted to take this moment, actually, as to talk about a tale of two bills, a tale of two very critical issues that confront our country, both deserving the time and attention of the Senate, but how they've been treated very differently from one another. The first issue, of course, is one that's been talked about here, and I'll speak about it in a moment, and that's the issue of student loans in America. I mean, this is an issue that I care about deeply for two reasons. The first is I myself, when I arrived here on the floor of the United States Senate in January of 2011, I owed over $100,000 in student loans. It was, a, and even before that, for, for years, we struggled with the cost of those loans. Uh, my parents uh, never made enough money to save for our education, so I was able to pay for it through a combination of Pell Grants 
and loans for both my undergraduate and my graduate studies. Uh, the, the, the undergraduate level loans were manageable. The graduate level loans for law school were quite a strain. At one point in our lives, it was the single highest expenditure in our, in our monthly budget. So I know the cost of this. And the other reason is because I have the honor of, of serving as an adjunct professor at Florida International University, where once or twice a week I interact, interact with young men, and, young men and women in South Florida who are facing not just the costs of undergraduate education, but starting to think about how they're going to pay to go to law school or get a master's degree or any other profession that they choose. This is a very significant issue. And there are two aspects of it that we're going to talk about in a moment. And the second issue that is just critically important for our country is the well-documented problems of the Veterans Administration. And I don't need to go into a long uh, dissertation here about how our men and women who have served us so honorably and so bravely in uniform deserve the very best care possible. And it's been well-documented, the long waiting lists, but even more importantly, uh, or even more tragically, efforts among some at the VA to cover all of this up, to cover their tracks and to cover up their incompetence. Let me be clear, the enormous majority, the vast majority of the men and women who work at the VA work hard and do a good job. But there are too many that do not. And there's not enough accountability with regards to that. As I said a couple of weeks ago when I came to the floor and tried to pass a, a measure to deal with that, uh, a companion from the issue that had passed in the House, uh, you're likelier to get a promotion or a bonus than you are to get uh, demoted or fired for not doing your job at the VA. Two very important issues, a tale of two bills because they've been handled so differently. In a moment, I anticipate that uh, a number of senators will come to the floor, uh, senators who I thank for allowing me to work with them to make this possible, and we'll have an announcement to make with regards to votes on the Veterans Bill. That's great news. Uh, the men and women who have served us deserve this progress. There's no claim that this is going to be uh, solve every problem in the world, but it is an important first step. And I thank Senators McCain and Sanders and, and Burr and Coburn and others for all the work they've done on this issue. And we're excited to hear about their announcement here in a few moments. And if they arrive, I'll gladly yield the floor for that at the appropriate moment for them to do that. But I thank them. Our men and women who have served us thank us, thank them. And the people of Florida thank them. We are a state with an enormous number of veterans. This is an important issue, and, and it was great. I hope, I wish people could have seen how people worked across party lines to get this done. The effort, everyone's got great ideas about things they want to see added to it, about things they'd like to see in addition to what's been included, but we all understand a sense of urgency about addressing this issue. And as a result, we all have ideas we wanted to pursue, but we were all willing to put aside those things for another debate and another day in order to get this done. We need more of that in the United States Senate. We need more of that in the United States government. And I thank the senators who have worked so hard to make this happen, and my colleague in the House, Jeff Miller, for the work he has done in terms of bringing this forward as well. He's done a fantastic job. Compare that to the way this issue on student loans has been handled, however. This is a legitimate issue that needs to be addressed. But the bill that was brought before the Senate is a bill that included something that the proponents knew was deeply political and controversial, the so-called Buffett Rule. We've had debates on that issue before. We can have debates about it in the future. But they knew that the simple utilization of that rule as part of this measure, as admitted, by the way, by members of the majority who have talked about this measure in the past, they knew that by putting that in there, it politicized it. And quite frankly, it doomed it to failure. So let me lift the veil a little bit for those who are watching at home or those who are watching in the gallery or those who are watching anywhere or listening, now or in the future. They knew what the outcome would be when they included that. But it was put in there for the purposes of saying Republicans blocked this. Because they knew that that issue in and of itself served as a sort of poison pill that held this up. And it's unfortunate because the issue of student loans is a very valid issue in America. Look, there was a time not long ago when higher education was an important option for millions of Americans. A time when, for example, even if you didn't have a college education, you could still find a middle-income job that allowed you to make it to the middle class. That's how my parents did it. Neither one of my parents had advanced formal education. Neither one, quite frankly, finished the equivalent of high school. And yet we lived in the middle class. We, we achieved the American dream because working as a bartender and as a maid, my parents were able to make enough money to achieve that. The world has changed. Today, if you don't have some form of advanced education, you are going to struggle to find a job that pays you enough to keep up with the cost of living, much less get ahead. This has made higher education no longer an option. It is now a necessity. 
This is an issue that needs to be looked at in multiple ways, not simply the loan issue, by the way. Take, for example, the story of a 41-year-old uh, head of household who has worked their entire lives to provide for their families and now has lost their job or their business. The only way they're going to be able to get a job that makes it to the middle class in the 21st century, because the job they used to have has been out automated or outsourced or the industry no longer is around, the only way they're going to be able to make it back into the middle class and stay there is to acquire skills and education necessary for 21st century middle class and above jobs. But if you're 41 years old and you have to work full time to provide for your family and you have to raise that family, you can't just drop everything and go back to college for four years and you probably can't afford it either. So we need to revolutionize how, what higher education means in America so people living those circumstances can access it in a cost-effective way. Take the story of a single mother. I, I used to have an employee when I worked in the state legislature. She was the equivalent of my executive assistant. She made less than $30,000 a year because, by the way, that's what the state pay grade called for. But she went to school at night and became a paralegal and doubled her pay on the day after her graduation because she was able to acquire advanced skills and a degree that allowed her to improve not just her lifestyle and her quality of life, but that of her daughter as well, a young single mother struggling to provide and move ahead in life. The problem is that our existing higher education system is only is the one that we had in the 20th century. It's largely designed for a student who graduates from high school and goes to college for four years. But it is inaccessible and unaffordable for Americans who are later in their lives who have to work full time and raise a family, for people who in the middle of a career have found their job outsourced or automated and need to be retrained. That in and of itself calls for higher education to be revolutionized. The second point I would make is that there is some innovation in higher education. For example, there are a lot of degrees and degree type programs you can now get online, but you will often find that the cost of those programs are as much or more than a brick and mortar institution would charge you. It costs just as much and in many instances more to get your degree online than it would by sitting in a classroom and taking lectures every day. And for many people, that's not realistic. So we do need to revolutionize what higher education means. The traditional four-year college, it would always be an important part of it. But we also have to have programs that do things like allow people to graduate from high school with skills that allow them to immediately be employed. More welders, more electricians. There's nothing wrong with that. Those are important jobs that we have shortages in, by the way. We need to create more innovation so that people can acquire learning in the most effective way possible. For example, why can't we allow people to package learning in any way they acquire it? Online, work experience, life experience, to be able to package all of your learning and acquire the equivalent of a degree that allows you to go to work. And there are real answers to these problems. I'm involved in at least three of them. One is a program called Right to Know Before You Go that I've sponsored with Senator Wyden. It is a bipartisan proposal. It's very simple. It says that when you go to school, before you take out a loan, you have to be told, this is how much people who graduate from our school with a degree that you're seeking make, so that you can decide whether it's worth taking out thousands of dollars in loans for a degree that doesn't lead to jobs. The other proposal is, is changing the way we accredit higher education in America today. Accrediting basically means you have permission to give college degrees. But the institutions who control that process are the existing status quo schools. And they'll always have an important job in our educational portfolio, but they can't be the only ones anymore. We need to change that so that there are alternative programs available that allow you to package learning no matter how you acquired it, so that you can get credit for that as well. So changing accrediting is a big part of this. I believe that income-based repayments should be a part of this. There's a more responsible way to do it. And thankfully, Senator Warner and I are working on such a proposal. I wish issues like that were debated as part of this solution, as opposed to simply a political stunt brought to the floor designed to get enough no votes by Republicans so it can be used in November on the campaign trail. Let me tell you, these student loans, a trillion dollars worth, they're owed by both Republicans and by Democrats. We need to get this issue solved if we're going to move forward. On the Veterans Administration issue, which I see that a number of senators have now arrived and potentially have an announcement for us, we've made great progress. The one I'm proudest of, the whole bill is important, but the one I've been working on personally, the one we've been engaged in making this happen, is accountability. Giving the Secretary the power 
to hire and to fire those mid-level bureaucrats that are not doing their job. That's an important measure. I'm glad it's included in this. I'm glad the Senate will be moving forward on this in a few moments, and hopefully later today, our men and women deserve better. A tale of two bills. One is an example of how we can get things done to address the real needs in our country. And the other is a missed opportunity to address one of the single greatest impediments to upward mobility and the American dream in the 21st century. And that's the accessibility and affordability of higher education. Because today, higher education is no longer just an option. In some way, shape, or form, acquiring higher education has become a necessity for all Americans. And we need to make that more accessible and more affordable. And it is my hope that in the weeks and months to come, that we will be able to pull us, put aside the desire to turn this thing into a political tool and come together to solve this problem. Because there's a trillion dollars of student loan debt sitting out there, and there are hundreds of thousands of Americans who desperately need to acquire some sort of higher education, and they can't afford it, or they can't access it, or both. And they deserve, they need us to address this issue. Because this cannot be an American century. And the American dream will continue to slip out of reach for millions of people in this new century unless we make the acquisition of higher education more accessible and more affordable to people from all walks of life. The 18-year-old that graduates from high school, but also the 25-year-old single mother, and the 41-year-old father who heads a household, and everything in between. This is an enormous challenge for our country, but one that there are solutions for. All we need now is the willingness to do it, and I hope that in the weeks to come, once we've passed this moment, that we can get back on this issue and solve it in a real and in a responsible way. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on these issues. I look forward to working uh, to pass the Veterans Bill here, hopefully today, and to move forward and work together in a serious and meaningful way to make higher education more affordable for every American who needs it in order to achieve their American dream. Madam President, I uh, suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.